This is Talk Star Wars. The official podcast at talkstarwars.co.uk. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Talk Star Wars. I'm Mark. I am Stephen with a V. I am Paul. And Rob will be joining us later. Uh, we're going to get straight into Boom. reviews this week, I think, because there isn't a lot else going on. Not a lot of likes, not a lot of activity. No news this week, isn't there's, there? there's a lot of news <laughs> for us to get into. This was like last week's episode. We just kind of ploughed straight in because there was so much to talk about. Um, all right, so let's talk about reviews. Don't forget, you can uh, take advantage of a Ron Burgundy policy. That means whatever you write in a five-star review, I'll read verbatim. So if you want to promote something like a blog or a podcast, that's where to do it. There's only one rule. Keep it clean, gentlemen. You're going to have one of these reviews each. We have two five-star reviews. Steve, you want to go first? Yeah. Um, it's, hello, hello. If you're looking for top shelf Star Wars banter, look no further than TSW. Mark is the captain, the hand solo of the ship. Boom. Rod Wade is the first mate and stands in for Chewbacca, although he is quite easier to understand most of the time. Paul is prim and proper, the protocol droid of the bunch, and Steve is naked. Yep, he's naked. The main <laughs> show, I am actually naked tonight. <laughs> um, the main show drops like clockwork and is great and consistently consistent. The Thursday show, be it the After Dark Side, my favourite, or the round table with, with Rob Cast or TWS, comics, etc., are just as good as the main show. And that's it's saying TWS. a lot. Besides having a monthly cameo myself, I don't know what more you could want out of a Star Wars, Star Wars podcast subscribe today you won't be disappointed I'm I'm just seen who guy. that is that's <laughs> CC and Dido music oh Steve Candido music yeah it's Carlos Carlos Candido how is, Carlos um, Candido yeah Rob, uh, Rob oh. Mark how is Talk War Star comics going yeah Talk War Star <laughs> There should have been you could no. have you could have corrected that as you went I didn't there, know Steve. It was a mistake. You put you the acronym in. <laughs> TS- TSW comics. Yeah. I was thinking, what's TWS? Isn't there like an airline? This is a this is a screen grab off of the email that I get I don't when we get. You're supposed you to be professional. <laughs> you're the captain of the ship. Han Solo flying into mm. an asteroid. You're you? right, Steve. Your only qualification is that you're naked. That's what everyone says. And then you I get read ahead. Rob's Somebody else loves it. Can, not you, Chewbacca. can you imagine how many people you upset last week, Steve? You had fan mail the week before. Everyone sort what of. What did I say last week? You didn't turn up. You said nothing. Oh, I didn't say a lot. No, but <laughs> Destiny <laughs> Two came out, and I'm a big kid. I know. I, everyone's going to understand if they're sci-fi fans that Destiny Two came out last year, and I couldn't miss getting behind on my my power level. Well, there you go. See. And they will understand, trust me, if they're yep. true sci-fi no, It's, it's good. Understand. It's good that you've got priorities. Um right, that yeah, so that's from Carlos Candido. He has a new um he was on a Facebook Live with us tonight, by the way, a lot of fun. He has a new YouTube or rather his son, JR, has a YouTube channel that you need to go and check out. JR's Toys. Um it's absolutely superb. JR is the mm. sweetest little kid and just like building Lego sets and stuff. He's just awesome. Awesome. Um, yeah, very, very cool. In fact, what I think I'll try and do is I'll try and put a um, link to the channel in the description to the episode so you can click through. Uh, yeah, we can, also, we can all tweet that out and share it on our sites as we go as well. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. It, it is awesome. It is awesome. Um, share the well. Okay, Paul, we have another five-star review. Uh, dun, 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 dun. <laughs> I like that. It's from a teacher. <laughs> Very well done. Uh, I've been binge listening to previous episodes, and these guys really put hard work into their theories. Sometimes they get it right, sometimes totally off, but every time they put thought and research into what they discuss. Uh, that's from Tally Aquelgo <laughs> from yeah. United States of America on iTunes. So yeah. that could be Tally. That's actually a proper review. Yeah. Tali, it's um, yeah. uh, that was a challenging name, hence I didn't attempt it. It's um, a really lovely Tally review. Though, well so they are, of course, completely right that we do. We're we're batting about fifty fifty, I think, for uh, predictions and so on. Sometimes we bag a big one, like the Kylo Ren thing that we did way back in the day when we picked him out in that first teaser trailer as being Han and Leia's son, uh, and sometimes. I am way off my game when I sort of say that Felicity Jones is going to be Mon Mothma in Rogue One or that the uh, the shuttle Tidarium was going to appear in Rogue One. 
You know, we don't pretend that we have any insider information. I'm we just guess. I think, Mark, all of those things. I think that you're wrong, but that's not new. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, yeah. you've cornered the market on wrong, mate. Oh, there you go. Thank you very much for the five star <laughs> reviews this week, and also for the interaction on YouTube. That's been that's become quite the place for. Um, vibrant conversation is bringing a lot of people into our little ecosystem so that's a lot of fun thank you over there especially people yeah. like ryan um who consistent Johnson. consistently jump not that one consistently jumps in every week and leaves comments um very cool stuff all yeah, right it's nice when people do that let's get into listener com shall we we've got a nice yeah, easy yeah. one to start us off um you can send your questions and comments to us via twitter or on facebook or you can send us an email to talk styles info at gmail.com. If you attach an MP3, we'll use it as a voicemail play into the show. Right, this first one. You can one, read this, Mark. You haven't done anything tonight. I'm going to do it now. Um, this mm. is from, <laughs> I might need some help with the big words. You might. Yeah, let me know when you want me to take over. There's okay. a lot of stuff here. Okay, this is from Katie <laughs> Stubbs, who was also on Facebook Live tonight. Katie's awesome. Uh, she has a poll oh, in she's the. She's a beep. She is a VIP. Yeah, I thought so. Um, Another name. She's put a poll in the Veep group tonight, actually. Paul, we're voting on what she should buy next. So go in there and click on that Millennium Falcon option I'm about to add. It's nearly a £1,000 worth of kit. Um, all right. Katie says, hey, Mark, hope you and the rest of the crew are well. Got my question for this week, and it's a simple one. What is your favourite Trooper variant? Keep up the great work, Katie. Mm-hmm. Troopers. Mm-hmm. There's been a Eat Trooper. There's been a plethora of of troopers. I think we've discussed this ourselves actually years. many moons back, sir. Yes. Yeah, probably at celebration when we saw all the cool ones wandering around. Uh, my choice is definitely one that's practical for cosplay, but gents, have at it. Your favourite oh. trooper, Hoth, yeah? Always said that. I oh like, yeah, no, I forgot about them. I like, big helm. Yeah, he's got a long helm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he's also oh got God, a really cool you need him? Well, he's also got a really cool <laughs> turret gun. He did awesome. have a, he did have a wicked and cool gun. They got like a, a long white cloak with a backpack underneath it and all sorts. Just look at the bomb. Yeah, seriously. they had like a white. Do you remember the action figures? They had like a white skirt, didn't they? Yes, they used did. Used to clip on around the uh, waist. Yes, they, they did. did. And I wanted the outfit. Yeah, I've seen a couple. Um, I think there was a couple at Orlando, and or there was at least one at Orlando that looks very uncomfortable being in that. Um, I'm going to take mine back, and and I forgot my favourite. I said a shock trooper, but that would be a blasphemy because it's actually the the speeder bike one on Endor. Yes. I don't know what they're called. Um, Scout troopers. The Scout trooper, yeah. Um, our it's friend um, Rob Williams over at the Generation X-Wing podcast, also part of the network, he, um, he is joining the 501st, so he's building uh, a Stormtrooper co- no, I'm going to get into trouble. You call, you call it armour. You don't call it costume. So he's building the armour and he's going for a scout trooper. And mm. they look fantastic when they're put together. And I understand that they look very comfortable. They feel very comfortable to wear when you're at conventions. Um, I really like something that's along that sort of lines and it's the Shore Trooper from Rogue One. Yeah. You know, like the beige colour yeah. one. I think that's really cool. Really yeah, that was awesome, yeah. actually. Didn't one of the of uh, didn't one of the bounty hunter guys have his own version of that? <laughs> it wasn't one of the bounty hunters that took Bodhi Rook. He was wearing a helmet. It, yeah, he? he had the black. He had a black version of the scout trooper helmet, didn't he? One Is of it the black? yeah. It was it was a black um, biker scout mm-hmm. helmet. Well, it was kind of beige. Really awesome. Wasn't was. there a darker scout as well, like a dark brown one? At some point in Rogue One, there was. Was there? That's the Shore what, Trooper. With right? the orange cat bit on it. I can't remember now. I seem to remember having orange and brown. I don't remember that. No, I but the, the, the Shore Trooper is really up. unusual design because it uses all those kind of, of colours. You know, they're, they're based on uh, Scarif, aren't they, those those mm. troopers? We were calling them Scarif Troopers for a while. Huh? Um, yeah, not as conspicuous as the bright white ones, but yeah, really cool. Have you? Mm. We, when we do our um, Rogue One audio commentary, we'll um, we'll have a long discussion about the amazing variety of stormtroopers that are in there. I'm sure. Mm. Yeah, Katie, that's good question, awesome. Though. Very um, good question, Katie. Yeah, what Katie didn't do was pop hers in there, so we're going to need um, 
We're going to need an idea from you, Katie, what your oh, favourite uh, trooper variant is. I can't believe we're hitting the old Myers already. We all popped ours in there, Mark. That's fine. <laughs> oh, oh <no>. my. <laughs> <laughs> Moving swiftly on. Um, right, this is not really a question, just a suggestion from Ian Jolliffe. So I thought I'd just go through this quickly. He says, hi, Talk Star Wars. An idea for the podcast, not really a question for the podcast itself. I'm using it, though. Um, how about in the future having a different listener join you four occasionally for the podcast, maybe just for part of Instead the show, of one of us, such yeah. as <laughs> listener comms. Well, this came in last week, just as Rob and I started recording. I thought it would have been ideal um, considering how we'd lost you two guys for the week. It would have been ideal to be able to bring a listener in. So I think I might try and find a way to do this. Um, so Ian continues, you might think it's a terrible idea and too much hassle and that's cool. You can say, uh, you will still be the best Star Wars podcast by far. Ian, you're far too kind. Um, yeah, I think that is something I'm going to look into doing. I don't know how we'll do it. I might have to. I might have to do some sort of poll on the VIP group. But I think when we know that there's going to be someone missing, we'll do that. We'll bring a listener in for the night. It's good. Right. Sounds like a planage. Steve. We to- Sorry, Paul. Did we manage to pull Rob Cast in one night? If I recall. Yeah, I brought, died. I, I brought- it's just. Rob thinking on. about the time situation on some of our guys though isn't it and that's the thing that's the problem yeah I, I know this evening on the facebook live we had nathan who's from New, uh, newfoundland we had uh, carlos candido from canada um we had rob weston jennings i think he's from somewhere in the u.s we, people all over the place on the facebook live they're probably at lunch and we're yeah. <laughs> we're winding down for the evening you know and they're all probably sitting we're there in at bed l- yeah <laughs> Some of us are naked, some of us are drinking, and they've all got to go back and work the rest of the day. Some of us are naked and drink. <laughs> Frightening. Um, Steve, you need to read Jim's... Thank you, Ian, for your suggestion. And yes, watch this space. I think we're going to do it. Uh, do you want to take Jim's question, Steve? Sure. Um, howdy, fellas. From Jim Ford, this is. Howdy, fellas. I feel obliged to throw my two cents in on all this Kenobi talk you've been doing of late. It seems most of you feel that Obi-Wan would not leave Tatooine since He had to look after the boy, Luke, as he was growing up. Now, I got to thinking that, you know, the reason Leia was captured over Tatooine was due to her mission to bring old Ben to Alderaan. It does seem to imply he wasn't too shy on leaving from time to time. Yay, he's with me. (laughs) If Leia had not been caught by the Empire and made her way to old Ben's door, what do you think he would have done? Would he go with her or flat turn her down and tell her to get the step in? Or... Maybe he would have seen her showing up as a sign and then kidnapped Luke to take him with them. That'd be cool. All kinds of possibilities, and you boys are great at working these possibilities out. Before I saddle up, I just have to say that Steve is a great part of the show. You pay him. Um, <laughs> that old boy does a mighty fine job. Keep getting her done, Steve. I said that with a West. <laughs> I don't know where that came from. Um, adios for now, amigos, Jim Ford. So, was Obi-Wan ready to just up and go when Leia arrived, or would he have sent her packing? Mm. He, mm. Mm. I think he would have gone. In all honesty, because the needs of the many outweighed the needs of the one at the time, and Aunt Beru and you know Uncle Owen were kind of cutting the mustard. So, yeah, I mean, if she'd have come calling at that time, that's a really cool tangent. It's amazing. It's a, it's a real it's a real melon twister. Again. That's a really really good question. Um, the guys on Tumbling Saber are in, Give five minutes. Uh, the guys over on so Tumbling Saber are ta- kicking this around. About? Sorry, Steve. When are we talking about exactly here? Yeah. When and she's on the hope. diplomatic missions of Alderaan. Yeah. If she she's hadn't been, yeah. been caught. She's on the way to get Ben, theoretically. Yeah, we know yeah, that now from Rogue One, don't we? Because um, Bail Organa says to Mon Mothma, or Mon Mothma says, what about your friend the Jedi? And he says, I'll send someone to get him. She said, it has to be someone you trust. And he says, I trust with my life. Um, and yeah, there should have been a bigger yeah. pause in that because it's hard to distinguish what was going on in that conversation. Yeah. It almost sounds like they were labeling Leah as the Jedi. <clears throat> oh, oh, I guess. Yeah. I suppose that is a, that is a possibility, a possible read. But yeah, she. Um, well, considering she's force sensitive, I would say she already knew he'd come. Who? Ben would have come if that happened. Oh, my Mothma? She's not force sensitive. No, Leia. Well, we don't, we don't know. She doesn't know she's force sensitive at that point, right? She doesn't know yeah, that we don't. She would unknowingly she's... know that she's force sensitive. She's, oh God, you're both doing the same <laughs> jokes. She, um, 
she knows that she just has to go and collect an old Jedi who's in hiding and bring him back to her father. She doesn't know why he's there. She doesn't know about Luke. She doesn't know that Obi-Wan has a mission on that, on Tatooine. So she just assumes she's going to rock up and he'll come running. I'm, I'm not so sure it's that cut and dry. I, I think this is... Well, Luke really is incidental to her question. cause, though, at that time, right? Yeah, I mean, he's no, he wouldn't he, actually. He wouldn't have been part of the scenario because he's on. Halloween. He's not. No, this now <laughs> no. at this point, they they have two hopes, basically. <laughs> A new they, one. <laughs> yeah, they have Luke, who's the bet their best hope. Obi Wan and Yoda's best hope for defeating the Sith, but they also have the Rebellion, <laughs> which is the best hope for bringing down the Empire. She represents that. So if Baal is sending for Obi-Wan, effectively the message Baal is saying, you can abandon that one, we've got the mm-hmm. upper hand. Is that a valid read, do you think? Mm. Aba- yeah, because Abandon end- Luke, we've got the upper hand. Yeah, because we've got the plans of the Death Star, it's all going to work out, not knowing the... Is that what you mean? Yes, yeah, exactly. That's what yeah. I mean, yeah. So, because uh, Bal knows, because he's in the inner circle, right? So, uh, at the end of Revenge of the Sith, he knows about the twins. He knows that Yoda goes to Dagobah. He yep. knows that Obi-Wan's taking Luke to Tatooine. And he knows that him and his he, wife... He's a very undervalued character, isn't he? Bal, well, well, maybe yeah, he's he crucial, thinks, though, isn't he? Mm, <laughs> maybe he thinks that the focus will be away from Luke because of the plans. Not necessarily that they'll win, Which also isn't the worst everyone... Thing. They may need everyone they can to make this work. Yeah, this is really, that's actually really interesting, Steve. The focus will be away from Luke. No one knows Luke exists. Mm. The, the it's universe, Ben that throws Luke into the mix. Yeah. Accidentally. The galaxy thinks that Padme died and the pregnancy hadn't gone, come to turn because she was, she looked pregnant in a, funer- in a fun- funeral procession, didn't she? So as far as anyone's concerned, anyone that knew she was with child, thinks that that's the way she went to a grave. Um, so Anakin, there's no reason to believe that, or Vader, has no reason to believe that his children survived, or child. He didn't know about twins. So Luke is safe, safely hidden away. The only reason Ben's there really, over, you know, keeping an eye on him, watching over him, is to be able to begin his training as soon as it's appropriate. And that may have not have been for a while yet. But the the events of Rogue One kind of speed things along and <laughs> Bell's message is pretty clear, isn't it? You can come out of hiding now. We've got the upper hand. We're going to... What I wonder what Mon Mothma really wanted him to do. I don't know. Why was Leia going to take him away? What was he going to do? Exactly. Yeah, well, that's maybe... A, is that not in let, uh, canon anywhere or...? No, not yet. Not not that I know of. It's um. Oh, it was an interesting thought about us talking about Obi Wan caring for Luke. I mean, I don't, it, all he could travel was on those floaty speeder things. They're a few hours away from where Luke's being kept, right? If Ben was going off world in a craft, he would be less time away from Luke than he is on foot on Tatooine. You see what I mean? Um, I do. I see what you mean. I'm not sure if that argument holds up to much scrutiny. I mean, if you're going off world, you're going for a while, right? They didn't just make the trip to the Death Star in well, the maybe afternoon. Maybe a neighboring, maybe a neighboring planet in that solar system, which is like minutes away mm. by ship. Whereas if he's on the ground and Luke's in trouble and he gets the scent, he's got to get his cloak on, you know. <laughs> That's an important part of the process. His shoes, his stick. <laughs> yeah. And the the thing is, I mean, the more the more he goes off world at any situation, he's making his presence known elsewhere. And the idea was he was a quiet hermit that was looking after a kid from afar. So exactly, they would have been the the <clears throat> Empire has agents everywhere, right? There's one in Mos Eisley that Aunt Beru, mate. Aunt gra- Beru grasses them up, doesn't he, to the Empire? That's that's, that's the Aunt Beru story. What's that? She's a, an agent. For Do the you Empire. think? Yeah, absolutely. I, I that, talking, those shifty eyes and that coloured milk. Come on. I was talking about the guy with the elephant trunk nose in in um, Moss Moss Eisley. You know, he grasses as soon as Obi Wan comes into town, he's all over, isn't he? Phoning the Empire and grasping. But would he have up. known? No one would have known what Obi Wan looked like. 
that point. I don't know, but he's wearing the Jedi robes, isn't he? He's got that's what gives it away. Busting out lightsabers left, right and centre. Isn't that taking a really stupid... Yeah, that's what did it. Mm. Yeah. The See, elephant man had already seen that at that point, right? Him lopping off some limbs. Um, yeah, yeah, because they're leaving, aren't they? Because the next shot after that is um, Han in Docking Bay 94. So it's all gone down at that point. Yeah. He was silly, Ben. That was a, he could have used the, the mind trick on that guy and backed him off. He, that was a really bad move for Ben to actually, you know, show himself, give all his hand away. <laughs> never thought about that. Why did he use the mind trick outside and not inside? Yeah, do you think he might have been... Um, I mean, this is a retcon, obviously, and it's head cannon. but do you think it's him pushing events along? The more attention, no. the more he's in, in a bar, he's drunk. <laughs> I was just wondering if the more attention Obi Wan brings to himself and to Luke, the less chance they have to just squirrel off back to their little lives. So, do you think that he knew at that point that it would all end with his own death and this part of destiny, blah blah blah? I don't know if he would have. I don't know if he'd have thought of it being a one-way mission at all because that was all. That only presented itself once they'd um, been swallowed up by the Death Star. So I'm not yeah. sure about him thinking it was a one-way mission, but I'm pretty sure he very quickly made the decision that he was going to go, Luke was coming with him, and he was going to do whatever Bell needed. Um, I think he was fed up with being squirreled away at that point. Let's, try, let's get this thing done. Do you think he was just bored? You know? Well, no, but I mean, it is whether it's Luke or the next, Successor, as the empire is getting too strong and it's going to succeed in its ambitions, it doesn't matter if Luke squirreled away, does it? It, it, something needs to be done. So I, I think he kind of wanted it to happen. Just read something, um, in relation to the bar scene, which I, I didn't immediately recall. Um, but if you look at the, literally the chronology of events, literally it only lasts half a second, obviously. But Luke does get smashed to the table. Um, oh. And immediately, one tries to draw his blaster. So Ben's like, "No, no, no, none of this. Let's just cut this quick." So, so the, the simple, the simple, you know, you are going to let us go to the, you know, what's the that on the corner? Paul? Wouldn't what have you, worked. You're reading like the screen. Yeah, just because right? so, somebody else has asked the question, basically. Mm. But in the in that flash of events that happens literally within half a second, it is a case of Luke does hit the table backwards, and the guy does go for his blaster. That's when he says, "No blasters, no blasters." Yeah. And then Ben's like, "All right, anyway, do this is let's cut off this walrus's arm." <laughs> so. here's a um here's an interesting <clears throat> perspective something i've never really considered before the empire had an agreement with the huts right to let them run tatooine and not really have much of a presence there the only allegedly the only um op- the only time that the empire really showed up was when the death star uh, was when the star destroyer rocked up chasing the tantive and then they all came down to try and find the droids so Leia coming to get Obi Wan brought a lot of heat to Tatooine, didn't it? They he was safe on Tatooine, hidden. Luke was safe with the Lars, hidden. Nobody even knew mm. to look there for nope. them. But Bao's attempt to pull Obi Wan out of hiding left him little or no option because they brought with them this enormous collection of Imperial troops. So, of course, he had to go. Of course, he had to take Luke with him. He couldn't leave Luke there right underneath no. the Empire's nose. So, he had no choice but to go. So, maybe the fact that Do you Leia... think he was miffed as well? Like, at... it's not... he must have been like, what the hell are they thinking? We were all safe here. Yeah, there's that. He, he could have yeah, looked at it like back, that. Get my You've pension. got the coincidental aspect of um, them chasing the droids escape pod from the, you know, from the blockade runner. So a lot of the troops were there because they knew the droids were there from Leia's blockade runner anyway. Yes, yeah. Yeah, it, it was... De- it def- I mean, that is the detail, but essentially the Tantive brought the Empire. If the Tantive had landed and Leia had gotten out, that was still would have brought the Imperial troops down the same way as it did the, the droids hitting the surface of Tatooine. So it really... It pushed Ben into action because how could he stay there? How could he leave Luke there when there's so much imperial attention but there's two ways looking at it steve he could have thought what on earth are they thinking they've just blown my cover or he could be thinking mm. this must be serious yeah. if Bell's willing to take this sort of risk then i have to go 
and Maybe, obviously yeah. Luke's going to come with me. So my to to go back to Jim's question, I don't think I think Luke would take Luke would always have gone, but never intended to leave Luke behind. If I I don't think Obi Wan would ever go off world and leave Luke unattended, uh, and this was like the the last example of that. He had no yeah, choice at this resort. point because the place is swarming with Imperial troops. So how are they well, going to kind of puts the kibosh on any off world, um, thing for, uh, the an next o- Obi-Wan film an Obi-Wan because, movie. because mm. Luke would have remembered he'd been off world. Yes. Yeah. I mean, it, you know, just cause it doesn't, I think my position is a valid read, but it doesn't mean that that's the way the storytellers are going to see it. I, I think I would be a little bit disappointed if, they did that and sent I think and, and split if them they up. create some sorry Mark carry on mate finish what you're saying no that was pretty much it I was just so, sort of saying I would be disappointed if they if they put together a story mm. where Luke abandoned um, where Ben abandoned Luke on Tatooine I don't that doesn't no. seem to be in keeping with that character's motivations no after he's done everything well maybe you know what if they create some maybe if they create some different biomes on Tatooine do you know what I mean like a yeah on yeah. the poles or something, then it won't seem so, you know, oh, we're here, we're still it, yeah, kind of thing. It, it, it's brown still, it's orange. I still think, <laughs> Do you know, know what I mean? With, um, with the saga movies, the Star Wars saga movies, they've always been about that thing where you go from lush environment to contrasting yeah. lush environment to contrasting environment. So that's always been a part of the landscape, but it doesn't mean that that can't be turned in on itself and you tell a story with just one like a monochromatic background it's the deserts of Tatooine but you just populate it with great characters and an interesting story yeah. and it will stand out in, in a way being so different as a Star Wars film um, and not you won't jump to hyperspace or anything yeah. unless you do have characters well, if you that make are it like world, a drama rather than a you know a bit of light hearted um, space opera yeah I think if you made it if you made it deep and meaningful, then yeah, the the all the the story would carry itself along mm. rather than relying on visual. And it doesn't always. What do you think, Paul? <laughs> Sorry, you, call, you <laughs> call me mid. You call me mid swallow. <laughs> you got Jack Daniels. I, I can send no, Jack Daniels. I don't. In you. No. Oh, I'll be getting one of those in a minute. Okay. Yeah. But yeah. So I, th- I think it's a it's an interesting. We're not really going to know, are we, about Obi Wan movies? We're way out. I think so. It's going to take but a while far away. to get to get the ball rolling on that one. But it's um, it's a fascinating fascinating concept for what they're going to do with this. And you can have, you know, no Star Wars film really has its heroes in one in one place. We always like we left Luke when he was on Tatooine, and we went off and we followed Leia's story on the Death Star, mm-hmm. and th- and then you go back and and then you're on Yavin. And then you're in space with the battle. So there's plenty of other stuff going on. So you could tell stories that are in two places, but Obi-Wan will be in one of those places and say they use a Ahsoka or they use a couple of the members of the Rebels crew or something or introduce, let's go nuts and introduce some new characters and have them doing stuff off world. And you could have like a twin, twin stories running parallel. Mm. It's, um, yeah. Yeah. Yes. That they don't. It doesn't all have to be about Obi Wan, does it? No. It, and then it, that's fine. That's fine by me. Then you're you're flitting off to a different visual in you know kind of tree, and then you're back to Tatooine. It doesn't seem like oh, okay, this is the same old stuff because you've been away. Yes. That would be cool. So yes, stories running in tandem together would be great. Yeah, it could be a way to do it. Hmm. Okay, Jim, thank you so much for your question. Um, Paul, did you want to add to this before we um, bring Rob into the call and move on to Ad's question? No, I'm good. No? I'm good, really. Cool. Jim, yeah. thank you so much. Um, Jim, you, Jim. You, sound, you displayed questionable judgment in part of your question Big there time. when Big you were referring time. to no, Stephen. No, didn't. But we'll I let love it, Jim. We'll let that part We'll let that pass. I'm going to send him a picture of my naked ass. <laughs> that that <laughs> call, the the call, British version. The call broke up there at the most inopportune moment. Um, <laughs> all right, Rob, you with us? Hello there. My goodness, that was entering with a bang. How oh, my. Oh, oh, bye. Oh, oh, you finally bothered to turn up then, Rob? Yeah, sorry, Steve. I, I was I caught the Steve 
syndrome and yeah. uh <laughs> oh, became yeah, unreliable it's temporarily. It's only a temporary bug, it'll pass. <laughs> Unlike yours, which it seems to be a lifelong afflict. <laughs> <laughs> I can't deny. Maybe. Yeah, I like to <laughs> I like to, you know, always keep them hungry. That's what they say in the uh, in show business, and that's what I like and, to do. Yeah, and we'll say which <laughs> you like the job as a social worker. Your timing, Rob. You can read the next bit. Yes. Yeah. Do I need show notes? Get your finger out. They're yeah. in. They're in the. Uh, they're in the chat. Oh, he's not even prepared, Mark. Oh, for God's sake! Are we oh, still yeah. in podcast mode, or can I be unprofessional? No. <laughs> no. You cannot. <laughs> I don't know what that. That was a really ambiguous answer. Which bit am you saying he, no to? So now we have to wait for Rob to get his finger out and open up the show notes and do Ready? his thing. Oh, okay. I shall then. <laughs> <laughs> do you know what page oh. we're on, Rob? Yeah, mad question, right? That's Ooh, the one. Uh, Just add Jim Paul. Go, girlfriend. All right. Rob's so, like a lumbo. <laughs> Just one more thing. <laughs> Who's reading? Is it me? Yes, yes. mate. Yes. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, that's that's a perfect it. opening then. Yeah. Well, here's me. <laughs> you had the From perfect ads. opening. Is that why Rob turned <laughs> up? <laughs> <laughs> I'm back, baby. Um, all right. So, next question is from Ads. And Ads writes Hey. <laughs> all right. Is that it? That's, that's, it. It. that's yeah, a good letter. Really. Right. <laughs> listening Thanks, to Ed. your latest pod, as, <laughs> latest, listening to your latest pod as I type and stop the car to send this in. Hopefully, you stop somewhere <laughs> safe, Ads. Um, great Not question just in the middle Jack- lane on the motorway. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Dogging. <laughs> He's turning his inside light on and off frantically, <laughs> and some bloke knocking on his window. Someone's yeah, familiar that or- with all the codes, Stephen. Stop the car to send this. <laughs> thanks to you, I didn't crash into that school after all. <laughs> Many thanks. Great question from James, and subsequent discussion by Mark and Rob. As always, you make your listeners think. So the chosen one, Mister Anakin Skywalker, created by the Force, perhaps. A super duper force user full to the brim with M&M's, who his uncle George comments fulfills the prophecy by bringing eventual balance. Okay, all on board so far. Right. What if the creation of Anakin, unbeknownst to whoever was responsible or known, kickstarts the force to awaken and create repeatedly in the future on a continuous loop? Anakin dies at the end of Return of the Jedi and his death leaves a hole in the force which auto fills itself by the creation of a replacement who doesn't necessarily have to be Rey. Perhaps Rey has replaced someone else who originally replaced Anakin. It also doesn't have to be an immediate replacing, but could happen over time as the Force strives to balance itself again. Just an idea, and feel free to phrase it in a better way rather than this beside the road. Oh, yeah, right. Um, <laughs> garbage effort. Right up at it, where you're meant to put in the quote marks there is just outside the school window. Um, <laughs> keep up the great work, one of all. Ads. P.S. Stops again. Kind of like a longer from birth version of the Doctor's regeneration. Now, the question is, could the Chosen One be a cyclical event triggered by the loss of the previous Chosen One? Doctor Who. Yeah. I don't know. Using the word Chosen One make it all a bit <laughs> interesting then, don't they? Yeah. I think yeah. ads is on some kind of SSI. Actually, no, you can still have a Chosen One on a cyclic or... situation, can't you? It'd be, it wouldn't just yeah, be Chosen One. You could have a chosen one daily, I suppose. It would be the, yeah. So, it, is... sort of, it sort of removes the magic of it. Cho- one chosen every generation. Mm. It still, it does require, I mean, the way it was framed for us with Anakin made it sound like he was this, like, uh, Jesus-like yeah, one figure, into, right? Yeah. yeah. But, um, but this would water that down a little bit, as in there are people in touch with the Force and they can see when these things are going to come into play. So um, those acolytes within the Force keep a watchful eye on things, look for signs that somebody is demonstrating that they may in fact be the chosen one, and then they're nurtured to fulfil whatever cause. Um, That's my belief about Rey in this trilogy. That's what I think she is. Hadn't considered it the way Ads has put it, though, with it being like this cyclical thing that when one goes, another one's activated, which, if that is true, the timeline would mean that there's one in there, right? A missing one? Um, no, unless they died at age about age 10. Why is that not possible? Talking, well, if you're talking about, well, no, I mean, it maybe seems it's, a little bit, maybe it's a another downer, cocky Star little Hawks kid movie. saying, I'm the only human who can do it, and then he can't and crashes into the wall. Not very chosen, then. <laughs> amateur podcasting, well, uh, <laughs> pod racing, rather. Sorry, podcast. Pod now, yeah. this is amateur podcasting, pod racing. I don't know what are we doing. The um. Yeah, she if she was awoken 
during the events of the Force Awakens, though, mm-hmm. there and and the last one was when Anakin died. Then there's thirty years, right? Mm-hmm. So who was there's it? Who was it? Previous one who died? Then? Balance. Then Somebody... no chosen one is required. Yeah. Ah, it's so then, about, that's yeah. interesting. So could it be that the, I am. the next chosen one, you are never failed and to interest me, Paul. If, apparently so, according to Carlos. If, um... <laughs> oh, yeah. and he did it. Time code. <laughs> if, um... I'm so glad it's not me anymore. So if the next chosen one's only activated when needed... Yeah, it, right. Well, he's, the question says, isn't it a, a, a balance of the force situation that might bring it around? But then wouldn't the force have been unbalanced six years previous when Kylo Ren fell to the dark side? Because it's not actually at that point. The but only, unless is his, one yeah, but is his, is, is his shift enough to create an, an absolute imbalance? That's the question. He's only Poss- a kid, wasn't he? Possibly so, not, but then my follow-up question would be, what in The Force Awakens was the event that tipped her over the edge? It was her flying the Falcon, right? Well, wasn't that we wasn't it after that was when the Awakening happened? Well, we, we think that, but we're reaching in our, ourselves there, aren't we? Mm. It just seems like an old man, then. We're reaching <laughs> ourselves. We're reaching ourselves. <laughs> we're reaching ourselves. Right, Winston. Awesome. Lay off the spot. I'll lay off the facts before I, recording. I like guys, sorry. I think he's wonderful. <laughs> I and love it. And he's no slouch in bed either. All right, but okay. this, this is poop. You don't like this idea, no? <laughs> <I think laughs> do, do you want to make your feelings on it <laughs> quite clear, though, Steve? <laughs> in a more sorry. prudent yeah, manner. Yeah, Sugarcoat, mate. Ambiguity. Tell us what you really feel. Yeah. All, this, all this ambiguity. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I think it's well written and it's fun and it's a brilliant question in the sense that this is the kind of question we love. Because yeah. it generates this kind of feeling, and but I think it's, it's never going to work, and so, it's too convenient. It might be if, Lu- if Lucasfilm want to make even more money, they might go. Yeah, oh, for God's sake! This is the Steve we've got tonight. Every time I open be, a box, it's a different version of Stephen that comes. It could tumbling be worse. Out. At least he's <laughs> not. No, you've seen now? that one before, mate. You've seen that one many what times. What have I done now? It's not blaming Disney. Uh, you've it's got mercies. for a naked man. You're wearing a lot of cynical clothing. Cynical, <laughs> no, no, cynical no, pants. No. No, I just, I just think it's, never, it's, never, it's too complicated for Star Wars. It is, Star Wars is it, supposed to be simple. No, you're absolutely right there. It is way complicated. What um, am I? Yeah, you're absolutely right because <laughs> it's, there's too much story to be told with to for this to, that point. to get to this. Yeah. It's all right for us to, it. but even you know when we start talking about it, you start thinking, well, what is the event that triggers the awakening? And then there's yeah. a, the story that needs to set that up. If it is simply that every time a chosen one dies, another one is reborn, they, that could be a thing, um, but they need to be able to communicate that. I think they will touch on that slightly. I don't think. So. You don't. No, you I don't. don't. No, we we don't spoke about it. this, I think, last week. But it, to me, it seems inevitable. I mean, Mark's made comments inevitable. about the fact. Inevitable. Fa- inevitable. 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 <laughs> Mark's made comments about how Luke thought Ben was the chosen one. And I think he misread that. What? Yes. Oh, sorry, Ben Solo. Sorry. Yeah. Missed. Yeah, but he thought Ben Solo was the chosen one. And that's why, to my mind, that's why Luke didn't see the fall of Ben Solo coming because he thought, oh, he's going to go on to do great things. I think the chosen one he's looking for is Ray. And he didn't know to look father afield because he thought he'd already found it. He thought that it was born into his family. He's probably expected it to be born into his family, but I think the chosen one was Ray. Oh. But what um, could have caused the awakening? I'm not, I'm not entirely sure. I know we, we don't even know what the awakening is. I know we, we... We don't. It's very, very vague, isn't it? It could be... I mean, you could speculate that Kylo killing Law Santeca tipped the balance. If that was the first life he'd taken do you know what I mean if it, yeah. if you said that Lawson, Law Santeca dying at the hands of Kylo Ren was enough to tip the balance right and suddenly he'd, he'd gone he hadn't quite gone full dark side but we know by now that he has because that yeah. was that was said wasn't it in the in the Bresna bomb of information mm. it, it was um, that yes Kylo Ren's gone completely to the dark side the killing of Han Solo right saw him go the full Distance, 
Um, do you think um, if you finish, Mark? Sorry. Yeah, no, I'm just I'm just thinking out loud, really, mate. It's just well, a stream I'm, of consciousness. I'm thinking, is there a post? You know this that there's been an awakening. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Is it possible that we've all got the fourth wrong, and actually the fourth is a being somewhere in some dimension, and it goes to sleep sometimes, and things happen. The empire gets strong, the Sith become, and when there's a powerful enough disturbance in that ripple effect across the fourth, then right. this thing wakes up. No. And I, feel, and, I, that, effect- I, I see where you're going. I think that would, if you were worried that the other thing was too complicated to explain. Um, well, you're only talking about a beat that's the fourth. And it yeah. gives some substance to the fourth. I think there's... Across, across the whole galaxy. Yeah. I do, I, well, do you know not? what? I think that that's... I think there's something there, Steve. I do. I honestly think there's something there. And we've kind of touched you're on this You're talking before. about a god now. Well, yeah, it's the it he is the in as much as it's the George's philosophy was it's the force of other, others. It's mm. us just existing together that's creating this this thing. Yeah, symbiosis uh, between us. Yeah, almost. exactly. And Qui Gon even oh, uses those yeah. exact. The words. idea of putting any kind of idol on top of it is uh, no. I don't mean God. I, I mean, just yeah, it, it's just <clears> the <throat> collective conscious of the force. Now, this is the thing that we've spoken about before, and we that it. Perhaps balance means that the force is just kind of dormant. It's just there. You know, like Yoda says, it surrounds us, penetrates us, moves between me and the rock and the ship and all that stuff. If that is the force's natural state, to just be dormant, to just be there, um, perhaps an awakening is when someone starts to apply an agenda to it in a way that, yeah, you know, like when the dark side rises up and they start using it for all of their cheeky naughtiness, that's the dark side awakening. And what Snoke felt was someone using it in a more positive way. Now, from the I think it's like the wind. TFA, it's Ray, but I think it's almost like the wind. Mm-hmm. Seriously, I think it, it it fluctuates in pressure and whatever, literally across the entire galaxy. But it acts upon um, natural natural forces such as the way we behave against each other, the way we, we behave against our environments and so on. And any negative behavior, regardless of your Jedi, Sith or Grey or whatever, has an effect on it. And that effect creates this big ripple effect, semi-cosine situation. Things are getting bad, things are getting worse. Just like you watch on the news every day. It's just general interactions that create good and bad vibes and the force reacts upon it. And it's only... <clears throat> Dark and light uses, you know, other force with, you know, could use power if you like, can bring that fluctuation back down. That's why a balance is necessary with both Sith and Jedi running at the same time. Okay, and so what would the balance be between those two entities? Peace or ignorance of each other, or uh, well, Ian. inaction? It could be both. It could be both. I mean, um, it, I mean, peace is the ideal situation, isn't it? But at the same time, just total neutrality and ignorance of each other would also bring about the same situation. Because they wouldn't, they, it would be, it's almost Tolerance. akin to peace because they don't know the know. other one's there. Yeah, but at the same time, if you're on the dark side of things, generally our innate feeling on that kind of thing would be, well, these are the bad guys, so they've got to be doing bad things. Which means the good guys have always got to do the good things and there's the balance again. So you can't really have a dormant ignorance of those two forces. There's always going to be a conflict of some kind, what and both if, sides need to win and lose continually. And what about if one of the Jedi, like Luke's the last Jedi, what about if he, hiding on Arc 2, away from Snoke, away from Kylo Ren, he can't be seen, he can't be found, presumably he can't be felt within, his presence can't be felt within the Force. What about if um, the Awakening is... You know, we've said before that the the Jedi and the Sith they can see the future, like they can see a possible future, right? Always in motion. So, what if Snoke and Kylo Ren, the awakening is Luke's coming back, and it's that won't start until Ray turns up on Arc Two, but they're seeing it. Is could that be a possible read of the awakening, Rob? What do you think? Yeah, I think that's yeah, that's poss- that, that's plausible. See, they just use the words "there has been awakening." Yes. Yes. They don't say it's theirs. They don't say who it is. They Mm, just feel that there's an awakening. So is an awakening another word for shift? Is an awakening another word for, um, you know, it's it's been seen by someone, like you say, an oracle situation? Because we still don't know what awakening means. That's a really hard one. Well, maybe it means that the force has awakened in someone. Like like Luke. Or Luke has re-entered. 
Ray, yeah. You know, if you, you think know. of the think of the force as a stream, and Luke's been sitting on a on the bank on one side of the stream, quiet quietly minding his own business, trying to stay out of things. Let's call that I don't know the Barish vow, which we've just been introduced to in comic books, and like Snoke and Kylo Ren are on the other side, getting up to all manner of mischief, and then Luke steps into the stream because he knows Ray's coming, and you know they're feeling that. In the future, after the Star Killer, they're feeling it. It starts his re- his entering the stream alerts them to the fact that he's, you know, he's back in the flow of the Force. It alerts them. That's the awakening. Luke's re-entered the Force. Perhaps I don't know. It's, it seems to me like a plausible theory, even we, though it gives the impression from what we gather that he has what he doesn't seem to want any part of it. N- he has no control on that awakening either. Possibly, possibly the Force does it, not him. He acts upon the fact that the force is doing it to him. I don't know. It depends how it affects someone's consciousness and morality. And yes, he, his Luke might have been seeing the future as well, communing with the the other dead Jedi band name. Mm. And so he's, he's sitting there daydreaming, minding him, you know, mind his own business, fishing mm. with a Borg, and it's like, oh man, I got to do that again. Yeah, <laughs> and Yoda, Yoda creeps up next to him and says, "Look, this girl's going to be here in about half an hour. You better put the white robes on." <laughs> yeah. Rob, do you want to mm. kick this about? What do you? What's your position on um, this awakening malarkey? I mean, speaking to the general question, I'm. I just I think people are so desperate for uh, Ray to be more important than she already is, mm-hmm. even though she is the most. You know. Um, She's the Mary Sue. Well, I mean, you know, even if you kind of, even if you look at sort of detach it from that, she's still the you know, arguably the most important character in the film. But for some reason, it has to be even more grand than that. It's like, well, <laughs> you know, but this, we've seen this twice already, so it could be a thing. And it's not that it's not like we want to position Ray so that she can be this fantastic thing. She's our eyes, really, into. Yeah, the goings on, right? She's the vessel that we view the film through. So mm. she she's like L- Luke and young Anakin and the films that the trilogies that preceded her. They step in, and even though there's this buzz of activity around Luke, like the Jedi think he's the greatest thing that's ever happened, and um, the Emperor thinks this is great. He's my next apprentice, and Vader thinks this is my hope. This is my new hope for salvation, or or, or to overthrow Pal Pacino, whatever his plans are. Um, Luke just thinks, I'm just a kid from Tatooine. He doesn't ever view himself as the bigger, baddest thing. So if Ray's in the same position, it's not like we're elevating her or the film's not going to necessarily elevate her to this lofty um, position of being the most important, most powerful thing in the film. She might still be that simple girl from Jakku and she's just being pulled in all sorts of directions by these other players, right? Mm. So even though she could be the prophesized one that Luke was looking for all this time and she could be Snoke's next toy yeah. to her, she's just this kid from Jakku that didn't have a family and is just trying to, she's just rolling with it, you know, and trying to make the best mm-hmm. of the situation. Well, she, that's probably what she wants to be. <laughs> yeah, she's, she wants she wants to explore the this new power she's found in herself. It doesn't mean that yeah. she's suddenly going to be she, I think what you're talking about, Rob, is Kylo. That's what I think that that is. How do you mean? With somebody who is leveling up in power all the time, and I think that he is the the version of Ray where everyone was sort of saying to him, "Oh, you're this great thing." You know, you, he's a prince yeah. essentially. Mm-hmm. He's. I think she should definitely I'm not, start exploring herself. I'm not. The, <laughs> I'm chef. not talking about. <laughs> I'm not talking about the character inside the film wanting to be. The chosen one and all that You're stuff. Talking I'm talking about, about the perception of the audience, the projections of fa- the projections of fandom. Yeah, right. Yeah, it's just this desperation to make her the chosen one because for some reason, even <clears> though <throat> she's she's the main character and she's got this fascinating backstory, it's not enough. Not enough. Right. Gotcha. Does that mean really? I want Kylo to be. You want Kylo to be the chosen one? Yeah. I don't. I want them to do. I want them to do something new. I don't want them to do another. Chosen Pork. One. Pork three on the left. I don't want them to do another chosen one. I want them to do something new. I don't want him to touch the chosen one. If they do, I can deal with prophecies. I think we talked about this before, Mark. Yes, yeah. I can, talk, I can deal with there being more than one prophecy, and that you know a pro- another prophecy comes through in the you know even in the intervening time between 
um, Jedi and Force Awakens if somebody makes a prophecy then? Because presumably you can make them any time in history, right? Yeah, I just it's made just one about. earlier. I was having yeah, coffee, go, made a prophecy while I was at it. But, uh, Is yep. there uh, any scope? the force of abandoning the whole thing and going you know what there is no balance anymore i'm out of here you're on your own and uh, that would be a good angle to go wouldn't it don't know the force awakens the force well, grumbles don't the force forget, if the force if the force is, a, is universe right across the universe right look at the story of star wars how's it how's it all start what's the first word right, a long time ago galaxy far far away so in our universe Albeit a different galaxy. Where's the force now? The force isn't about now. There's no mysticism or supernatural stuff. So okay. is it not is it not fair to say that whatever happened millions of years ago in a galaxy far, far away is isn't happening now because that has gone before. So did it leave and go into another dimension or did it die? Did they kill it because they couldn't retain the balance? That's a really interesting oh, oh. question. I mean, by the time we get to the OT, there aren't really that many people around, around who appreciate the Force anymore, are they? They, they don't recognise it as a thing. It's almost treated like myth and rumour anyway. And when mm. it was, when the Jedi were active, there was only like 10,000 of them, so it wasn't like it was everywhere. And people, you know, it was a very niche thing. Mm. And if you forget, something can you practice it anymore after a while mm. not really so maybe the mm. force maybe that's what luke's talking about you know, maybe the force is fading away and leaving no? no i actually don't dislike that yeah i mean it's a really interesting it is a really interesting concept because it was so it's not not everybody is aware of it right there are people that they understand it um, as an ideology. They understand it intellectually. People like Bayes and Chirrut, they were the guardians of the, the church where this stuff was kept. So they understand it intellectually, but they never use the force. They're not force sensitive. They're faithful. The force, the number of force sensitive people, the people that can actually appreciate it for what it is, it was very uh, has been very small since the prequel trilogy era, narratively speaking. So perhaps the fact that it, it the force might not go away, Steve. It's just the people that can can tap Real into it. it die off. Yeah, mm. sort of. You know, they're just bred out, as it were. Yeah, it's almost yeah, like diluted. The, it's still there. The metachlorians are still there. The force is still moving in yeah. and around everything. But the people well, that are aware right. of it and can manipulate it and interact with it, they they go. They're the ones that go. Mm. Yeah. Which it's could a, be what the chosen one, what the the vergence in the force concept of virgin birth and all that stuff. Maybe that's the force trying to boot itself up. So, with that in mind, and post the next trilogy, the trilogy we're in, is there scope? Or would people be interested in Star Wars films without Jedi or lightsaber battles or anything like that? Is there a way? Because obviously, at some point, like take Harry Potter, well, you do that many, one. Well, you, yeah. yeah, you do that many movies about something, and it's got to end somewhere. They ended Harry Potter. That could have gone on a lot longer because it dies of its own accord. Otherwise, so is there scope? Yeah, Han Solo. To move Star Wars somewhere else. Han Solo. Yeah. It's exactly that, isn't it? There mm. won't there won't be any Jedi. So there, there's unlikely to be any lightsabers. You know well, I mean, I'm just, it's just, I'm reading between some lines, to be honest. It's just like Han Solo thinks this stuff no, is all hokum. I don't know for a fact, no, but I'm thinking that if we're following Han and he thinks that it's all boo hockey, little friend's <laughs> reference, if he thinks it's all rubbish, right, by the time we meet him, so he's not going to be moving in those circles in his own movie because he would be ignorant of the fact that there were Jedi there or people with lightsabers there or Sith there. It's um, to him. He's not going to be seeking it out, is he? No. No. So, and we're going to be with him in the movie because that's the guy we're following. So the Empire are going to have a presence, but they're really going to be like a militia. They're not going to be like the cult of Sith. Mm. Oh, they're not going to be the minions of the cult of Sith. They're going to be 
perceived as the militia of this oppressive government. And they're, they're not going to be anything fantastic. Han is a down to earth guy. He's not going to, he doesn't believe in this religion. It's, he thinks it's all hokey. So I think this is the well, first film the where we don't get them. Necessarily believe it in the beginning of a new hope. Of course. Says, Enough of your full something ways, Vader. You know what I mean? They're all. That's it. Your sorcerer's ways, yeah. Yeah, sorcerer's ways. Yeah. I don't then know. he got choked I mean, by nothing. <laughs> yeah. Do you think there's going to be another trilogy after this one? Yes. <clears throat> I do. do. I, I absolutely do, yeah. Well, I mean, look, from a financial perspective, they've got money to make, haven't they? So, yes. I think they will, but I'm not sure how long they can string the whole Jedi thing out for and the chosen one. And I think you'll be surprised. You know, well, I yeah, think you'll I mean, be surprised. Yeah. You, go, do it right, you go backwards you, and you can go forwards. I mean, once this Skywalker saga is done, there's nothing stopping them doing one, you know, once they haven't got to worry about treading on the toes of this story, they're free to tell standalone stories set in the prequel era that standalone stories set between the Return of the Jedi and Force Awakens, they can go into the future mm. and tell stories about new characters that can be Jedi, that can be Sith, that can be whatever you want. It's um, I would like to see modern day on Earth with this oh. and the Force <sighs> are appearing here. Oh, Why goodness. not? Why not, though? Like, the Force raising its head, for want it's of a, a better word. a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. It doesn't matter. The Force is across the entire universe. The Force, if the Force isn't an entity, We don't know it's outside the galaxy they're in. Um... I just need to just well, say, it has to be, wouldn't it? ads. See what happens when you don't. <laughs> yeah, it's your fault. Right yeah, when you when you ads. let Steve answer a question. Write better questions that don't have Steve thinking. Hey, hey, that's not fair. No, well, you know, I mean, I don't yeah. mean that his question was poor. I mean, it triggered the wrong Steve. Um, mm. Ads, thank you so See, much. At this point, I'd like to get people to back me up on this. I don't think it triggered the wrong Steve at all. I think it's made. There's been an awakening. That's what there's been. Yeah. In my underwear, I'm not wearing. Oh. Um, ads, I'm with you. I do believe that the Chosen One is, in fact, a, a, a cyclical event. I like the idea that it might be triggered by the loss of the previous Chosen One. I really do like that a lot. Um, and I think you might be onto something. Whoa, 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 whoa. But we didn't lose the previous Chosen One. Well, we, lo yeah. we, we lost Anakin. And then, and what's the point of the chosen um, one? What's the what's the thing for them to die then? But, what they're chosen for? They're just not. Just the thing. Make Luke it. was still alive, very much so, and in his thirties when his father was still walking around. Or yeah, but life. we're not suggesting Luke's a chosen one. Okay. We're suggesting Anakin was, and he had to bring about balance, which he did, and that's George's read on the situation, right? Mm. So Anakin restores balance, then everything's balanced for years. Then whatever this awakening is could be what triggers the imbalance, and that's when Ray enters. It doesn't mean like it's Tuesday at ten past four. Something's happened. Tuesday, and, and so the <laughs> and so the next one's woken up. Right, that's not the way it works. It could be it's very non-linear. So Ray being born, uh, what did we say? She's about nineteen, twenty in the movie. Yeah, sort of late teens, early twenties. I think is the so is the idea. Ray's born twenty years before she's needed. So that she's ready to go, and the force knows when she's going to be needed, or at least the possibility that she will be needed, and then events conspire to make that mm. that possible vision of the future coalesce into a reality. It's Luke's, you know. I'm using Luke's seeing the guys on Bespin as a template. There, it was one possible future, and he made that come to pass by leaving. Um, what so. An idiot. Yeah, you know, he should listen to his, his elders and betters. Anyway, we could go around and around in circles if on this goes one. goes on any longer, I'm going to send Dad the bag full of squirrel poo. I think it's... Uh, <laughs> we don't give that stuff away free. He, he's got them. He's crazy. The Mark's so. got a draw for that <laughs> next week. By the way. Do you know why squirrels swim on their back? Oh, uh, is this an anti-joke? To keep their nuts dry. There you go. All right. Really? Not, not an anti-joke, just no, a just regular a joke. joke. Ads, yeah. thank you so yeah. much, sir. I'm sure we'll get some more of this in The Last Jedi. Right. Who read that one? Um, Paul, do you want to read Omer's? Oh, but this is really long. Do you want me, to read, to, read. Do you want me to read yeah. Omer's no, question? No, I'll manage. I might just cough a lot, that's all. <clears throat> okay, from Omer. Hello, boys and girls. I'll let you pick who's who in 2017. Rob. We don't judge. 
<laughs> uh, I hope you're all well. Even Rob. I must be ill. So, <laughs> over the past week or so, I've watched a few movies. Some of them with my little girl, one without. Guardians of the Galaxy 2, How to Train Your Dragon 1 or 2. Again, I'll let you pick which is which. <laughs> uh, hey, what's that mean? Anyway, which ones you watch with, watch with the little girl? Oh, I see. Okay, okay. And they've both made me, uh, made me think about Star Wars, particularly the ongoing subject of exposition versus storytelling. In Guardians of the Galaxy 2, Yondu, Yondu yep. Yep. is told mm-hmm. he won't hear no horns of freedom when you die and the colours of Ogord will not flash over your grave. I have no idea what, this is, what direction this is now going in. <laughs> At no point does he tell us what they are <laughs> and they're never mentioned in the first film. And unless they're explained in the comics that I haven't read, they're an entirely new concept, but we must instantly go, ooh, I bet those things matter. Likewise, in How to Train Your Dragon 2, Hiccup flashes a flaming sword out of nowhere uh, he didn't have that in the first film, and although I know he made it in the TV series, it's never explained in the, to the new viewer as to what it is. But because we know the character is good with devices, we go, "Cool, he's got a fire sword." In both cases, we have to go with. Uh, sorry, in both cases, we have next to go, to know exposition for the new concepts, but we also don't need them. Do you think Star Wars can do this with things like kyber crystals, barish vows, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, instead of not introducing them for fear of alienating the audience? Well, that's more words than I ever wrote in school, so I hand it over to you. Thank you. Genius. Force you. Bye. <laughs> that's awesome. Thank you. Uh, Omer, you. Omer, you are a genius. Um, yeah, so the breakdown, and Star Wars simply burp up new things like kyber crystals and barish vows without explaining them. Have the comic books ever been covering these things uh, to the back door concepts ahead of the film? Sorry, Ooh. yeah, I didn't. Uh, I shouldn't have used so many <laughs> colloquialisms in that. Um, uh, what I meant was, could the com- are the comic books covering these elements so that they can sneak, there, sneak them into yeah. the films later on. Is there um, padded background canon that, that Mr. and Mrs. Smith don't get when they go and see the films? They stuff? don't get, but if they stumble into it, they think, oh, what a wonderful tapestry this has been uh, crafted by a true genius. Um, what do we think then? I think... I, th- I actually think he's right, but in the o- I'd go in the opposite direction. I would say they are introducing concepts in the comics that they can introduce in the films without naming them. Yeah. So they could they could talk about the Barish Vow without actually saying it's the, it's called the Barish Vow. Mm-hmm. They could he could just say I made a you know I made a solemn vow to not involve myself in, ga- in galactic uh, events anymore. And people who've read the comics will go oh, that's the Barish Vow, and the other yeah. ones will go oh okay. Yes, that's exactly mm. that's exactly my position on that too. Mm. Kyber crystals think, is that's a different barrel of monkeys, isn't it? I think um, you can't the, the, to compare how they do exposition in Guardians of the Galaxy and Star Wars are two different things. One is looked at to the minutia level, which we're doing now, and the other one is light-hearted fun that you don't have to take too deeply. For some reason, Star Wars is taken to another level and for that reason if you do introduce something people want to know why and they want a bit of backstory and they want it to link to the canon and they do they want all the things that they talk about on the podcast you think that's true of the majority of the audience though steve um no i'm I'm not sure that's unforgiving for a minority yeah but in the way you know like omer points out the stuff in i mean the way I guess there's another way to look at this, right? The stuff he's referencing from Guardians of the Galaxy 2, all that, mm-hmm. all those fancy words that are just exhausting me <laughs> reading them, um, about the colours of a gourd and all that sort of stuff. The Horns of Freedom. That's clearly setting up that moment later in the film, right? So it's, yeah. it's, very, um, it's very clearly expositional dialogue, and so you have context for what happens later on. The the thing in How to Train Your Dragon 2 is very much an example, I think, of the Barish Vow. So right. the the fact that that character just produces a sword and no one thinks that it needs any explanation whatsoever and the audience yeah. just keep going with the pace of the movie and it doesn't throw them off, mm-hmm. I think that's probably what we're looking at here. If the movie started with um, Leia saying, have, you ever, have I ever told you about the Barish Vow? That would be that expositional dialogue that sets up Luke, they could do it in an opening crawl, couldn't they? 
Ray has, uh, yeah. Ray has interrupted Luke Probably. on Arc 2 where, he, where he's been undergoing his bearish vow. They could do it there. They could. And set it up because that is or that is the quintessential example of expositional dial, expositional text, isn't it? That opening crawl. Yeah. I mean, there's one thing to keep in mind with this, the Horns of Freedom and the Colours of Ogord, is you don't even necessarily need to know what they are. You'd see from Michael Rooker's acting that, that's a, that it's something he's upset exactly. about not having so i don't think you just des- you don't necessarily need it explained no um it's Barish like any Bell, other techno I think jargon, you need it explained it? yeah i think with barrish you need it explained more than you need it named you need it so yeah you need it explained more than you need it referred to by name yeah yes but that's easily is- done and i think actually that's the way around it we're likely to see it but isn't the idea of exposition you know it, it's talking about important background information not just yeah. incidental stuff. Yeah, it's information that enables you to understand what's going on. Yeah. What what it, you're about to experience. So mm. it's stuff like oh, pass me the hydro spanners. It's not necessary. It's, it's not it doesn't matter to the plot in any way shape. Would you like to form. know the history of hydro spanners, huh? <laughs> I'd love yeah. to. <laughs> Let me just go to Wikipedia, <laughs> which of course is what he carries in that pouch of his. Um, Absolutely. And apparently now he's speaking full on English. I always know. Oh, hello there, Han. <laughs> hello, Han. Oh, one Captain moment. Solo. I seem to have cleared my throat finally. <laughs> <laughs> you um, know that uh, Karelian whiskey is very good for clearing the old pipes. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> anyway, hydro spanners, eh? What a what a lark! <laughs> <laughs> oh dear, yeah. So, um, yeah, it's the difference between stuff in there to color the experience and stuff in there to decode the experience for you. Um, Kyber crystals, we already know about them now from Rogue One. We've already been educated, so I think we'll hit the ground running with that, even though it will be the first mention of a Kyber crystal in a saga movie. It will will have that knowledge coming in from from Rogue One. But the Barish I think, Rob, I think you're right. The concept will be introduced... The actual terminology will be geek fan code for us to um, for us who read Let's the comic books to say. Oh, we know yeah, what we, that is. Yeah, we can assign it. Let's say I, I'd be more in, I'd be more inclined to think they're going to name the concept rather than actually uh, say the words Barish vow. Yeah, it, it's far it, more likely they're just going to say I took a solemn vow not to interfere in the galactic events because otherwise, yes, you know he he has to say I took a Barish vow. Oh, what's that then? Yeah, it's oh, well, that required it, reading thing again, isn't it, Rob? Where you're yeah. saying to the audience, you don't know this because you haven't been getting the audio uh-huh, books uh-huh, and audible. Uh-huh. It's tree house. I think it's called is it tree housing or gate. There's gatekeeping is one of the things they call yeah. it, and it's that thing of like, oh well, you can't enjoy this unless you're a proper nerd like us. And they're not going to yeah. do that. They're not. No, stupid. they're not going to do it. They're not, they're not going to introduce tears to fandom. They're, well, they might, but it, it will, not, you that, not those think, kind of tears. Um, do you actually think Star Wars does exposition good anyway? I mean, I've been well, sitting here thinking about a few things they they did really badly that were pivotal, like midichlorians. Is exposition I mean, something you do good, or is it something you do well and therefore it is good? <laughs> Irony. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I don't know what you just said or understand it, <laughs> but I can tell you that they did insert midichlorians in and then not explain any of it, and it was important to the story, but yeah. completely turned, did a bad job of it. That falls, right. and all that it falls did somewhere was in the middle, them. doesn't it? Mm. Yeah. Paul, what do you think? You're sitting there quiet. Are you drinking? He's BRB'd. Oh, okay. Because uh, he's AFK. Bob. WTF. <laughs> um, all right. Right. Uh, Omer, um, great question. Really thoughtful yeah. and insightful. Um, all right. He had a pop at me, so forget he, him. He did have a pop at you, and I'm going to congratulate yeah. him for it because you are a yeah, big Yeah, I love that bit. You that are a big chap. Oh, do you know what? <laughs> so, what show, anyway. Rob, you can take it. Stop being such an um, asexual, because I can't say girl, because that's derogatory towards women who are one. Whereas asexual, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Just go with well, your yes. reflexes, Steve. Probably not the best. Stop being a gender that doesn't exist that I can slag you off with. I don't know. Um, you could have just said pillock. Why don't you just say pillock? Yeah, that, that would have worked. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that was an interesting question, but it's a bit boil your head again. It's yeah. in my brain tonight. Yeah, I think it's it, too many good questions. It's a nice, it's a nice question because it's on. I like things that 
I like it when we can examine the lore of Star Wars and also like things when you can examine how the films are made. And this is one of those interesting ideas around how they make these films and the sort of juggling they have to do to kind of get it right and the do you need to have read this book before you understand this film that that is a tightrope walk and i love to watch how they uh gracefully or not so much handle it and in turn we get to examine each other indeed turn your camera off all right the next question <laughs> is from reese um reese won a um a couple of vintage return of the jedi comic books in our draw last month Ooh. So oh okay that's the, that's what he's referring to here <clears throat> that what i've just done is expositional dialogue it was good because i did it well um all right hi mark and the guys i wanted to let you know the comics arrived yeah. see exposition um they're so cool i <laughs> uh, love your card too i put a business card in there thank you yeah, right. um, i really had no idea i had one <laughs> When I reached out to you on Force Friday, uh, it was quite a pleasant surprise. I'm not on Facebook, so I can't catch the live events. But just let me know who wins the Funko Porg, and I'll ship it off right away. Yeah, see, um, Reese popped into a local Target. Reese is in, Cal- oh. I think he's in California, and he okay. picked up one of the. Is it a Chase Porg, Rob? Oh, the, yeah, the one There's with the a, open mouth. No, this is a different variant. He's got his. Wings oh, out. That a new tri- not Storm, the gormless, not the gormless looking one. He's got his wings out. Uh, not the gormless looking Ooh, one, no. He's got that. That's the one that come out in oh, Kent. Wing. He's got his wings out, yeah. Um, so anyway, moving on. Uh, I had this intriguing yet awful thought while I was listening to some of your previous episodes. Sounds lovely. That, while I don't think it would be popular with fans, would be a semi-logical way to send off both Luke and Leia's characters. All right, brace yourself. Bear with me now. Oh, what dear. if Leia kills Luke in defense of Kylo? I could see Luke and Kylo fighting towards the end of The Last Jedi whilst Leia and Rey look on. And just when it looks like Luke is going to dispatch him, Leia kills Luke by force grabbing Rey's lightsaber off her belt and driving it through Luke's back. Leia saves her son but betrays her brother. Rey and the Resistance... Oh, sorry. (laughs) Betrays her brother... These commas. Um, Sometimes I just trip up on them. Leia saves her son and betrays her brother, Rey and the Resistance and must be shunned away. This could also set up additional conflict for Kylo and Rey in Episode 9. Kylo seeing his mother throw away everything she's dedicated her life to for him and lo- and Rey losing yet another father figure. What do you guys think? I know it's pretty dark and probably won't happen, but think it could be a shocking way to end Episode 8. More shocking than I am your father, perhaps. It'll keep us talking for two years as we wait for episode nine, or perhaps I've gone mad. Either way, I'm excited to hear what you guys think. Have a great show. Keep up the great work, your friend Reese. So, um, mm, I don't. I love the idea personally. I think. Do it's you? A brilliant idea, and one I hadn't thought of. But what isn't uh, Mark Hamill already in nine? Yep, yeah, doesn't. But, yeah, but if there's one franchise, said it, keep, said it before, say it again. Blue there's Ghost. one franchise where death is not a permanent obstacle to appearance. It's Star Wars. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, yeah, he Harrison could be a even commented ghost. on that today. Yeah, and also, would would Carrie, they didn't change Carrie Fisher's character in eight, so but they don't want her in nine. So where would she go once she's called Luke? Does she go off and go? All right, I'm going to some place where I can reflect well that would actually that would actually work better in addressing that's the that's what um rob your theory is my favorite theory about um losing Leia now to like the to exile um mm-hmm. it works this works perfectly to set up that exile i'll give yep. you another, i'll give you another example in a minute but this works perfectly right. to set up that exile but um I can't see how it would be in keeping with the original story they were telling for Leia, considering how she was supposed to be at the center of episode nine, unless she was going to be one of the big bad in episode line in episode nine, which I really doubt. No, I could the, I could see the, the, an alternative approaching, which is if they went down that route, um, then they could bring up, you know, they could kind of send her away or she could go off in kind of shame for the end of episode eight and have to come back in nine because they need everybody, every hand on every hand on the tiller. Mm -hmm. So they could, you know, 
realize that that uh, there are bigger things than a single family you know like a family feud almost and um they could bring her back in as a kind of you know we understand the bigger picture we need everybody we can to fight the first order and all that stuff yeah and then at the end it's like you know she goes off again and they're like this doesn't change anything you still committed this heinous act and you're not welcome yeah you're still in a the resistance yeah exactly yeah he's still a tool but you know Prince is tall. <laughs> I think it's more likely that I would like to see something that might work better if you want to dispatch both of them is okay. for uh, Kylo to get the upper hand in a fight right. and Luke disarmed and Kylo rams his saber through Luke and Leia protects Luke, stands in front right. of him and the saber goes through both of them. Right. right. They're born together. That's... They're born, born together, die together. You, oh, oh, Steve, okay. that is that is beautiful. That mm. is absolutely beautiful. Um, so just shut up for a minute. Paul, I want to get your get your <laughs> point on this before Steve drops any more wisdom on us. Okay, well, the thing is, it's quite, it's quite abrupt in the breakdown, isn't it? And we've all got our takes of what we think is going to happen at the end of this episode. So I'm going to have to go, no, I don't mm. see this being the situation. Because I think, um, I think, and honestly, Leia, I know it's tricky to balance what's going to happen, obviously, on the loss of Carrie. But I think Leia is going to be our Han Solo in this movie, as in uh, Empire Strikes Back. I think Leia is going to be drastically injured at the oh, end of okay. this film. And that's our cliffhanger. Yeah. Now, whether they choose to, obviously, end Leia's story in Episode Nine at a mm. distance from that point, And it's going to be the injury that actually starts the redemption for Kylo Ren. Okay. Okay. So that's why okay. I see that. Yeah. I can see that. I don't think I don't think Luke's going to have anything to do with that part of the storyline at that time. He's going to be very busy elsewhere. I think with Ray and another. I know theoretically everybody's assuming it's going to be Luke, Kylo, and Ray. I'm not entirely sure that might, that'll be the case. Okay. Was well, in the ones fighting the final battle? That, yeah. Okay. I don't even know if it's going to be the final battle. I think we're going to find these guys are going to get together quite early. It's going to be interesting. Okay. I mean, and the other side of the coin is we keep hearing how much Ryan is kind of switched things up and changed things around a little bit. And if he's, I kind of hope he's gone for a different first, second, third act situation that people are expecting as well. And I excuse, uh, I apologise for the land spear that's just gone past my window. Oh, was it right. you? <laughs> Happens to the best of us. I just thought it was Rob. By which I mean me. Um, all right. Steve, I loved Hello. the born together, die together thing. That is the that is one of the most exciting ideas I've You've heard had. about, oh. yeah, uh, that's one of the most from exciting ideas ever. I'm ever going to steal from you and make out that it's my own in a post on Talk Star Wars tomorrow. <laughs> that's, it's fa- that's a fantastic idea. Probably not going to happen because I don't think they're going to dispatch either Luke or Leia in this movie. And of course, they can't come back to that idea now because Carrie's not around to embody Leia for that um, for that scene. But that's fantastic, and what a shame that couldn't be a thing. Um, this Reese's idea, I, I'm going to move some things around and make a bit of a suggestion. What if, let's just say, I, I can't imagine Leia killing Luke. It betrays both the character no. of Luke and the character of Leia. But yeah. what if this duel, the, the pieces are all on the board in exactly the same way, right? But Luke can't fight Ben. I don't think he's got it in him to confront his nephew and kill him. I, I think he cares too much about him and understands the situation he's in too well to want to kill the boy. So I think Kylo could get the better of Luke. And just as he's going to take the kill blow, Leia pulls that Skywalker lightsaber into her hand and blocks it. So she stops Kylo from killing Luke. Then the choice is, does Leia strike down Kylo or let him go? And this is the point where I think she would say, I'm not going to kill him. Like, run. I don't ever want to see you again. And he turns off his lightsaber and legs it. That's what means she she has a chance there to end everything by taking him down for the greater good. But she doesn't because it's her son. And that is probably why she thinks, Mm. clearly I have no value here anymore. I can't do what's required of me. Like the she she maybe a younger version of her would have. And if it wasn't her son, she probably would have. Um, and so that, that's why that's I think assuming. she would go into exile, her version of the Barish Vow, yeah. if you like. 
that's assuming she's forced capable then and not defensive. Well, that would be so, the that would be the reveal, though, wouldn't it? Wouldn't that yeah, be the but fantastic reveal? Could that could reveal? the awakening be heard? Possibly, that could be the thing that you know. If we're saying the the, the awakening is a future event that starts to coalesce, it could be it could be her. Yeah, I think there's something in canon about her trying to study the force with Luke, right, and not really getting not really getting very far with it. Okay. But could that work? The f- the fact that she is finds herself in a position where she should dispatch Kylo Ren for the greater good, but doesn't because it's her son, and so she fails or she perceives it as a failure and leaves. That could put her in the Han Solo position at the end of this movie where we one of our heroes goes and we don't know if we're ever going to see her again. Hmm. There, it's all interesting. All of those sound like really good, good ideas. Whether I want to see them is another story, but they all seem feasible, don't they? Mm. Yeah, mm. I think so. And we're in double digits now, aren't we? Until the last Jedi. So I think you better start bracing yourself, mate, because it's going to happen. Leia's mm. leaving this story, and we're not going to see her again. So. It's just how they do it now. We know it's going to happen. It's just how it happens. Mm. Bad times. Anything you want to add to this, to Reese's question, chaps, before we wrap it up? Nope. Nope. All right. We're going to um, go to our break. Reese, thank you so much for your thoughtful question. And thank you for the Porg. We'll do that draw uh, by the time this is published. next. It'll be next week. We do that draw, so I'll let you know who wins. All right, we're going to have a quick break, and then when we come back, we've got a couple of bits of Star Wars news. Not a lot's really been happening, so um, we'll be right back. If you'd like to support what we do here at Talk Star Wars, you can do so by becoming a TSW sponsor. For as little as £1 per month, given securely via PayPal, you'll help us keep the lights on here at Talk Star Wars. When you become a TSW sponsor, we will automatically make you a TSW VIP. As a VIP, you'll get access to an exclusive stream of content that provides you with a daily podcast called the TSW Kessel Run, membership to the TSW VIP Facebook group, priority releases of shows such as the TSW Toy Box and TSW Comics. You'll also get priority access to the TSW Feature Com series and weekly Facebook Live and AMA sessions. There are also newsletters and a monthly prize draw. Head to talkstarwars.co.uk forward slash support and become a TSW sponsor today and the force will be with you always. And we're back. Uh, so that was our VIP spot. You might want to join up for that. There's plenty of stuff being given away this month. So uh, everyone's a winner in there, baby. Right. Let's get to some Star Wars news. Last Jedi news. Potential spoilers. I think it's fair to say potential spoilers throughout in this episode. Um, so if you are going dark on these future movies, then you, you might want to check out here. Isn't every question we answer a potential spoiler? Um, I don't know, a all... One in a million chance we might get something right with our theorizing and speculation. Yeah, but you know these th- these things are based on people that actually know what they're talking about, and we're uh, just a bunch oh. of cowboys. So uh, <laughs> yeehaw, yeehaw! All right, uh, Mark Hamill. Uh, there's a couple of quotes this week out there mm-hmm. from different uh, interviews. Uh, I think this came from GQ. Oh no, this was that sounds in, possible. This actually, did do this was in, GQ. there was GQ and there's also an empire. So this is, um, Mark <clears throat> talking about Luke in the what? last Jedi. Uh, Luke's changed a lot. It was shocking for me to read what Ryan had written as I'm sure it will be for the audience. I was surprised by the way he saw Luke to hear him say something like it's time for the Jedi to end. And I wasn't even sure I agreed with it. Being the caretaker of the character, I have a possessive attitude towards him, and even though it's not the way I would have gone, the more I got into the work, the more I realised I was wrong. Hamill said this in an interview with Empire Magazine. So, yeah. So, this is something we've heard before. Yeah. Steve? It's been somewhere. Did you go outside? Check check your mic. Or stop breathing. I think it's in your nose. The latter would be preferable. (laughs) Um, Out. So this is that comment we've heard previously, isn't it? That he yes, didn't really, it but it's yes, just a little bit more artfully worded. It is a yeah. completely rehashed version of the original of the previous quote. Mm. Yeah, is this Mark slow walking back with his previous comment? Do you think? 
I think it's the same kind of. It's, it's the just same emph- thing. Yeah, it's just kind of touching on the same feelings, isn't it? Mm. I, don't, I think it was like six words different. <laughs> yeah. Steve, Steve, you had a huge problem with this, didn't you? It's because he's asthmatic for the sound of it. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I had a problem with. What, with Mark or? With Mark not liking what Ryan had developed for I didn't me. have a problem with Mark not liking it. I thought it might not bode well for the film. Ah, yes. Um, and I, I still possibly think that. Obviously, he's a professional actor and you don't have a hissy fit. So you take what's given to you and you act it out. So maybe he's, you know, doing some um, damage control there. But I don't know. I've seen the film. But. I I I have reservations. I have reservations even more about episode nine now. I we'll come to episode, that. Yes, yeah, we'll come to that. But um, <laughs> we're crying out loud. Yeah, I, I think uh, <laughs> he found a way to do it anyway, didn't he? Yeah. yeah I think it's going to be fine <laughs> if they use some of the ideas we spoke about in this podcast. It's not too late to change your story and review. Yeah, just download us on iTunes or. <laughs> Stitcher Radio. We'll, we'll pop along. We're now in the tu- <laughs> tuning app. Um, okay, so oh, cool. yes, it, there's. Um, I think there's some clarity here. I know that it's not incredibly different to the original statement, but I think Mark saying the more I realised I was wrong, I think that's really helpful for people who had their confidence, Stephen, shaken in what Ryan had done. I think hearing Mark say that should give you some. Uh, comfort, and I'm going to reiterate the thing where Mark thought that it would be a good idea for Luke to have a mohawk and an earring in Return of the Jedi. Um, <laughs> that is true. He That's does, ridiculous. He doesn't always knock him out the park, Mister Hamill. No, 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 indeed. I mean, what he what he does on screen, flawless. Um, ideas, not so much. All right, Jabba, release my friend. Oi, oi, oi. <laughs> He'd be wearing, like, really tight plaid trousers as well. Yeah, that's it. And DMs. All right. Ryan Johnson also made comments about Luke. And this is what he said. Luke is no coward. He's not hiding from a fight. There's so much in this. There's so much in this statement. Uh, Luke is not a coward. He's not hiding from a fight. So there must be some reason he's there that makes sense to him. That was the first nut to crack. The seed for the whole story is inside that shell. I just had to get to it. The Force Awakens might have been a film about Luke Skywalker, but The Last Jedi is Luke Skywalker's film. Missing for decades, his trusty X-Wing rusting beneath the waves, Luke finds redemption in the form of Rey. Ryan Johnson just unpacks so much for us. I don't think we ever take the time to really listen to what he's saying. But this is a great statement, right? Luke finds redemption in the form of Rey. What is what do we think Luke's redeeming himself for? Wasn't it Ryan who said that he was mistaken in thinking that Ben was the tra- was a, was important? Was that Ryan or Mark? In the, I'm not in, sure. Um, the EW. Uh, I know you've said that. I'm not sure. All right. Well, Ray allows Luke to correct the mistake he made with Ben. Yes. Yeah. Yes. That seems reasonable. Yep. Is it feasible also that Luke... No, I'm right, end of... Let's move on. <laughs> that Luke actually saw Han's death 20, 10, 15, 20 years ago, knowing that he couldn't change it, and it was because of mistakes mm. he made. Mm. Do you know and that, he already knows that he's dead. That's a really good point, actually. That's a, that's a great thing, Steve. You remember I said about Dagobah, where Luke... If Luke had just stayed where he was, there'd be no need for Vader to do what he did to Han and Leia. The fact that Luke was predisposed to leave Dagobah. He was young, though. He was impressionable. It it could be that now he's thinking with Ben killing Han, he could be meditating on that, thinking, right, I'm seeing this as being the potential. Now, last time I ran off to stop something, I helped it happen. I made it happen. Perhaps he was thinking, if I just stay put on Arctu, that might not happen. And it mm-hmm. happened anyway. It might be that he's not, he's finding it difficult to read Kylo, read Ben Solo, mm-hmm. and work out the best choices to make. <clears throat> or he saw mm-hmm. Han's death through the eyes of Kylo. Cool. Knowing, knowing he was his student. 
when you watch what, like a like almost like a one like Ray's force vision. Mm-hmm. Oh, that would be brutal, wouldn't it? For Luke yeah, to actually witness that. Didn't she? she had yeah. future vision. Yeah. Mm. And Luke's much more capable than she is. So maybe also, you know, maybe he's too. maybe having lost um at the Jedi Temple, lost losing good people to the dark side yet again. Maybe he's like a bit down on the whole force thing and has given up on it, hence the time for the Jedi to end and he's doesn't really want the force anymore. He doesn't but he's got it, he's stuck with it. And maybe he sees the light in Ray and that re really like his fire? Fire. <laughs> <laughs> There's a song in there somewhere, <laughs> in there. and then they do like Gary a, Barlow's in this film song. too. Yeah, I could just imagine it'd be really, really cool. You've got Kylo and uh, Luke sitting opposite each other, almost in lotus position in a temple, and Luke mm-hmm. sees inside and sees everything happening, but he knows he still can't change it. Mm. Imagine carrying that. Mm. It's like, yeah. well, it's only Han, your family. <laughs> if he, um... I think there's going to be a flashback in this film to when Han dies. You know, you said he knows. And did possibly. You know, you said he knows he can't change it. Do you? Is it clear cut that there's nothing I can do to change it, or is it? I don't know. If I leave, does that make it happen, or if I stay, does that make it happen? Well, no. Whatever you do, it's going to happen. If he left, it would happen. If he stayed at that, but the force knew he wouldn't leave. It's like the whole Back to the Future thing, isn't it? I'm, you can't I'm, change I'm it. Gonna need the more thing is, that, I think the weight of him being around was far greater danger to everybody, so he still had to leave. Luke. Ha- ha- yeah, Han was um, collateral. The Luke worst form. The worst form. But Luke did leave. Oh, no, you're talking about Dagobah now. No, you know, I'm talking about his exile. Oh, his self-imposed exile in Art 2. Bless you. Um, yeah, Thank I know you. what you mean. Is there a three? Yeah, I'm talking about not leave, I'm talking about not leaving Arc Two to go and save Harm now. Uh-huh. So a more recent. Yeah, no, I thing. think he's already seen it, and I think he just knows he has to deal with it. Mm-hmm. And that might be where Mark Hamill's gone. There's no way Luke would do that, and Mr. Ryan's gone. Ah, but what about A, B, C, and so on? Uh, that's a really good point. Is that yeah? Let's uh, let's go back to to Mark's comments. Um. After that, I've got a point that you might like as well. But do this first. I realised I was wrong. I was surprised. Yeah, I was surprised by the way he saw Luke as being somebody that wouldn't spring into action to and risk his own life to save his friend. And to hear him say something like, it's time for the Jedi to end, it's very negative. You could be onto something there, Paul. I wasn't even sure I agreed with it. You see, it is very difficult to sort of imagine Luke knowing that it was going to happen and not doing anything unless he was confused about if I leave, does it cause it? If I stay, does it cause it? And he's kind of trapped in that thing where he's hopping from one foot to the other. I don't know what to do. Rob, you said you had a you had a theory. I had a thought that while we were talking. Um, it's not bad. So I know. Um, I think the think, hamster might be. It, <laughs> it is um, next to me. Yeah. Before you start, ah, oh, that Rob. might be why it's missing. No, Don't let him go. Let no, no, it's all right. Sorry, I need to formulate my thoughts it. anyway. It Let Steve go while he's still got it in memory. Yeah, it leads directly from Mark. If I don't say it, I'll forget it. Right. Do you think that when that look he gives Ray is the look of oh dear, everything that I saw is real and it happened, and I know Han's dead now. Maybe. Yeah, I saw you because you're here up with a lightsaber, just as I saw it. You've come. Did you come to kill me? Oh, he didn't see her, and he's like, what are you doing here? Yeah. <laughs> Go, Rob. Do you All need right. me to validate your parking? Sorry, Rob. <laughs> Save the ticket. <laughs> Save the dream. Avoid Save the fun. Um, Did you sign my sponsor? So, <laughs> there must be some reason he's there that makes sense to him. I'm about to... Uh, I, can hear, I, I can hear a blowing noise. And get yeah, ready, because it's your fine. <laughs> he has never seen those books in the force tree until the first time we see it in that trailer okay. and he needs Ray to get there oh what, holy uh, crap because he yeah, found... he's got a beer belly he, had, and she'll he has a rebels it's the he rebels thing a, he needs, two, he needs uh, two force users to open the door yes that scene <clears> we talk, we've, we've speculated rebels. on the We've speculated on a couple of these things before, but my brain's just put them together for the first time and made them do things. Couldn't you just open it with a light? That we didn't have a light, though. No. 
Well, okay, cool. don't like that. Also, don't, in yeah, R2's yeah, it's an X-wing. This tree's made right? of the Force. I'll cut it to rip. Yeah. The, on, um, the, there is precedence for it, Paul. Yeah. That in Rebels, Ezra and Kanan needed to go to a temple and open it together in order to gain access. Um, and the same with Ezra and Maul, wasn't it, Rob? In uh, Twilight yeah. of the Apprentice Part 1, I think. Yes, I believe so. Um, yeah, that's so, the first yeah. time he's seen. So that's the first time he's seen those books. He's not been. We've been speculating that he might be the sort of uh, the self-appointed he's, gatekeeper. So he's been sitting there for a decade, just waiting for what a plum. Someone. But no, he's been. He's up. been. He's been missing for decades. He hasn't been on Arc Two for decades necessarily. What's he been doing? Plane travel, travel. No, he's. You've seen the bloody map, Steve. He's been travelling backwards, looking for the first Jedi Temple. Yeah. For a reason. For a reason. Because in there is the Journal of the Wills. Oh, that's a great idea. I uh, said that. And now he's found the temple. Now, that, that, if you look at that frame of the trailer, yeah. the way he drags his hand across the Jedi symbol, it doesn't look like somebody that's had that book for years. That looks yeah. like that's the first time somebody's experiencing that, doesn't it? That mm-hmm. kind of little caress across the page. Yeah. That's really interesting, actually. It is quite a good idea, Rob. I will give Thanks, you mate. it. What about... How Ray does it says, f- why are pages 74 and 75 stuck together, Luke? She's like, I have yeah. no idea. And I, then you know, Yoda's in the background know. going, move on, <laughs> yeah. move on. Judge, you will not. Because <laughs> he did a force beat. What if they open... What if they finally get the thing open and Yoda's in there? <laughs> Couple like, of spotlights. Like a pop-up pop Yoda. And the music from <laughs> Your car Who car. Wants to Be a Millionaire. <laughs> Place, oh, I will. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I like. I really like that idea a lot. That that's the first time he sees those books. Yeah. And I, really I like think that. Rob's on to something there. Yeah. You need to. Uh, that's. He's been. You know. I. Then tell you what, Steve. I'll go you one further. That look that he gives right at the end of the film is. Where have you been? I've. Been, I've. If you turned up earlier, I could have done this ages ago and got back in time to save Han. Yeah. <laughs> so he's going to put a guilt trip on her as well. The other thing is, no, right, just, next just the, guilty right next to the Journal of the Wills is the toilet. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> He's been dying to go. If you look closely on the hill, you can see him just doing that little wee-wee dance back and forwards. <laughs> Maybe he's gutted because he's used the Journal of the Wills as toilet paper. He had nothing else. <laughs> and if he'd arrived earlier, he'd have the book. Oh, dear. And the Pogs all running around with toilet paper around them like the puppies in the Andrix over. Covered in. <laughs> uh, they're, they're covered in brown stuff. <laughs> God, I'm, I'm Thank dying. Goodness for that. Thank dying goodness for you're here, Ray. I've been, I've been looking for, I've been using these Pogs for I've been definitely. with Pogs for years. <laughs> and all the Pogs say, we second that emotion. Okay, <clears throat> let's... Yeah, um, speaking great, of, just before we go on, idea. speaking yes, of yes, 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 Journal of the Will, have, have, you seen one of the, have you seen this book from a certain point of view that's a bunch of short stories? Yes, we were talking about it in the Facebook Live this evening. You see the quote from Tom Engelberger. No. That's may not the real fo- name. May the force be with me as I begin the sacred task of writing in the Journal of the Wills. Is he just so in being that book, funny? No, the name of the story is Wills. Really? Yeah, so it seems like he might be actually the first person to ever write something that is contained within the Journal of the Wills rather than just like, you know, George Lucas in the in the novelization where it was like a... You know, this book is for Bunty, um, McGee, and my wife Stephanie. Um, <laughs> any, any, um, Bunty McGee. <laughs> Bunty <laughs> McGee. He's a pod racer. The kids. No, it's just it's a. They got posh kids. What ben Quadraneros and Bunty McGee. Right. Let's. <laughs> it's not too. It was two first names. Yeah. So who's Angleberger? Uh, the author. He needs to change his name. Why? Yeah, that's rude. Yeah. Seriously, that's like well, hateful. it's almost like Jen's got a book about uh, di- like a recipe book, and the woman's name is Crescent Dragon Wagon. That's amazing. <laughs> that's an anti joke. <laughs> your mouth out. That's brilliant. <laughs> it's an amazing book. It's, a, it's, it's an amazing, amazing name. Is know, it recipes Crescent... from Middle Earth? <laughs> no, it should be, shouldn't it? Fix her your dragon wagon. On the front cover, she's got a, a big bowl of fruit on her head. That's good. Has she, got a ni- has she got a nice pair? This episode of Talk Star Wars is brought to you by Weird Topics of Conversation. By Crescent Dragon Wagon. <laughs> and that's not made up. I know you're all Googling it. 
it's, no, I believe you. I, I, do you know what, Steve? I haven't even checked. I believe you. I believe that's absolutely she, a thing. She lost her husband, God bless him. He went out oh. riding his bike and he got killed. And then oh, he drove her to write a recipe oh. book. That's, it's really, uh, that's it's a really need, good if you ever want to buy it. That's a needlessly dark story. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, but it's a brilliant book. If you ever want a good book about right. vegetarianism. Right. There you go. I don't, well, maybe I will. I can't say for sure. All right, let's move on with our last Jedi news because we've got a big ticket item to get to. So, um, Ryan Johnson was in Japan at the weekend and he was at a, um, a press conference, a, a press event, and dropped a couple of little secrets about The Last Jedi, one of which was that Joseph Gordon-Levitt is going to be mm-hmm. voicing an alien in a very tiny cameo in this movie. Oh, my. Uh, Ryan and... Um, <laughs> Joe have been rude. they've been good friends for a long time and he's been in a lot mm-hmm. of his movies yes what do we uh, make of Joseph Gordon-Levitt being in The Last Jedi and um, what do we think he's going to be voicing uh, I'm fine with it I found I saw people actually upset by this I was like well oh, you know because somebody said just wait in the wings to hate though Rob well somebody said um I couldn't even I couldn't deal with Gary Barlow and now this it's like yeah but there's a little bit of a difference I mean one is a is a pop star who may have cameoed in something else but otherwise is most primarily known for music and one is actually a Hollywood actor it's crap isn't it's a little it? bit different I'm with you start. and also he's an awesome actor yeah he's an incredible actor he's a fantastic he's actor look at him in Looper and in and, he's fun, and he's fun as well he seems like a fun dude yeah He's in one of my favourite films, Fifty Fifty, which I I've not seen that. Fifty uh, Fifty is beautiful. I'm now is about beautiful? I'm about the that. fourteen minute mark. I can make it to that before I start crying, and it's getting. Oh, okay. I, I'm getting. I'm tearing up earlier in the film every time I watch it. So I'll probably right, just. Did just you do the film about the Blu-ray and start crying? Support. Yes. Did he what? Yes, yeah. he did. Oh, yeah, I, I, I did think so. Yeah, I'm oh, yeah, so, um, yeah Don, it's good. He directed Don John it. or something, isn't it? Don Juan, yeah, it's very, very good. He um, he directed it, I believe. Very good. Don Don John or something like that. Yeah, Don, Don John, John is it? something like that. Yeah, yeah um, Don John. Yes, 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 yes. The only thing about um, this cameo what, is I don't want it to prevent us from ever getting him in the films proper. You know, it's okay. just this is just a voice cameo, so I can't imagine yeah. that it will get in the It'll way. Be a, Passing character, like an incidental character, isn't it? I would have yeah. thought. Well, like uh, James Bond did. Yeah. 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 And that's that's what I imagine Gary Barlow's cameo is going to be like, Daniel Craig's. That and was his, was he was already in it, wasn't he? I thought it was in Force Awakens. Who? Daniel Craig. Gary Bar Gary Bar. No, no. Gary, um Daniel Craig was. I thought Gary yeah. Barlow was. No, he's in Last Jedi, Barlow. Oh, is he? Mm. Okay. I would imagine he's not. I, I can't imagine he's anything other than a small. Yeah, it'd just cameo. be a fun cameo where he'll know, you know, like um, yeah. Tom Hardy as well. Yeah, but yeah. With JGL, I think he's probably going to be. Someone put this on Twitter the other day. You know, the little creature that looks like a little um, croupier on Canto right. Bite? It's oh, like yeah. a little shrimp yeah. thing. Someone right. suggested that has to be the character that he voices. And I think that's bang on. I think it's a yeah, superb idea. Can I just say, Mark? Yes. Like. Uh, is there anyone who's on this podcast or listening this, to this podcast with zero acting not, um, experience who wouldn't jump at the chance to voice the, a character in Star Wars? I would. No, I mean, of course not. These, all over exactly. All over yeah. like, these people are, are Star Wars fans. It doesn't mm. matter if they're actors or not. It's a cameo. Yeah. It let's, let's let them fulfil their dreams as much as we would want ours fulfilled. Both the major oh, well cameos said. we've had well so said. far. Here, here. Both the major cameos we've had so far. The people cameoing had the wherewithal to say, "I need to not be on screen because yeah. it will distract." So mm-hmm. one was in stormtrooper armor, and Simon yep. Pegg was under layers of makeup, and he yeah. even did the voice. So you, you'd be hard pushed to know that that was Simon Pegg mm. if you didn't. Yeah. If you didn't. If you weren't in the know, you wouldn't pick him out and go, oh, is that guy from Shaun of the Dead? It, but if he was on screen, out of makeup, you might. I bet mm. you they're not getting paid. None of those three characters probably got paid. For them. They'll get oh, scale. Paid, they'll get scale. Yeah, they'll get like day, like a day rate equivalent. because yeah, it's guess. union, yeah. 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 Do you, screen you, uh, Mark, 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 Gary Barlow, I don't think did. Did he? Because didn't he, wasn't he in, around the set and then they just did it? Yeah, but I think there are union rules. I'm not entirely sure. I think there are union rules. Well, you might rules. have got a penny or something or a dollar. Or yeah, but I think you'd have, to be a me- 
wouldn't you have to be a member of the union going in for Gary in Gary Barlow's case? I wouldn't imagine he would be. That's true. And that sometimes they don't, you know, there's so many rules. If they don't speak, they don't have to be unionised. Mm-hmm. But it's it's all very complicated. Mm. Um, hey, this, a load of hogwash. this next thing, there's a couple of quotes here from Ryan, which kind of are pointless now because of events that have transpired since. But Ryan uh, Johnson says, uh, well, John, uh, Ryan Johnson also skillfully judged a question about whether he would direct episode nine. He said, I'm focused on The Last Jedi right now, just trying to get this movie out there. But whoever does it, I'll be really excited about what the next filmmaker has to show us. He went on to say that he's looking forward to sort of being an audience member uh, for episode nine. Nice. Um, but of course, the, the way things have played out, which we're just getting to, Steve, um, it's uh, it's a moot point now. Uh, quick, there's an image in the show notes that we just want to look at very briefly. I absolutely love this image um probably a little bit too much i might actually print this and frame it because i think it's such a cool thing this is from the han solo movie uh, ron howard tweeted out an image of han solo speeder with han in the cockpit but it's over it's almost like from olden aaron reich's pov so you're looking down at the controls of the speeder mm-hmm. um what do you think of this guys and this is kind of split people again some people not liking it so much. I absolutely love it. What do you think, Paul? What do you think of this shot? It's uh, pretty damn cool, actually. I do like the way it's gone back to old style Star Wars um, production set. <clears throat> it's not too glossy. Nice big dials. Lots of basics. It's groovy. It's groovy. That's it looks like it's gonna. It looks like it's gonna kind of shake and fall apart and so on. If I recall, this is that kind of book cover style. Exactly. Speeder, yes. Yes, it is yeah. indeed. This, yeah. That's this is a work of art inside and out. I like it. It's good. Yeah, well, I'm not saying I'd frame it and print it the same as you, but it's a cool shot. <laughs> no, I'm I'm going. Oh, it's going to go up on my wall of uh, of cool Star Wars things here behind the computer. Rob, what do you think of this? Yeah, I think it looks nifty. Um, it's got that sort of old tech feel, like seventies tech feel to it. Um, and it looks like it's got a tape deck in the middle of the wheel, so that's handy. Um, so, <laughs> yeah. yeah, for his uh, tunes, you know, and he's got driving gloves on, which I think is weird. Well, that's what Han wore in Episode Four, isn't it? Oh, yeah. So that's how we know. If you look at, there's a couple of little elements of this photograph that really point to it being Han. The the trousers, or the pants, depending on which side of the Atlantic you're from, um, Mm -hmm. have like the blood stripe detail down the side. Right. It's black and white. I don't know if they're coloured or if it's just texture in the material. Mm -hmm. Um, And then there's the gloves, which are absolutely Han's gloves from A New Hope that he Mm -hmm. wore in Docking Bay 94. Um, Okay. Yes, it's really, and these trousers are just like covered in crap, aren't they? It's really sort of grungy. Steve, yeah. Steve, what do you make of this? Do you like it? Yeah, I like it. I think it's cool. Yeah. I mean, it's not really a lot you can't like. That's why I don't understand why people don't like it, because what's not to like? It's a picture of a speeder with hand in it. Yeah, people are saying it's a little bit too stylized, maybe. It's um, oh, but you, not they all can't that do stylized. I mean, I'm the biggest moaner I know about Star Wars. That's funny. You're the biggest moaner I know. You're the biggest moaner I know. And (laughs) if I can't see anything wrong with it, then there's nothing wrong with it. It's got to be perfect. (laughs) It's not. You've got to stylize. They're in an art form. It's the entertainment industry. If they just said, oh, have you got that Polaroid camera? Take a picture of that (laughs) and put it on the line, will you? (laughs) I mean, it wouldn't do very well, would it? For God's sake. No, I guess not. Yeah, but but Steve, there are some photographers and directors that actually do pride themselves in producing that kind of raw imagery as well and they get praised for it yeah but there's mm. nothing wrong with that either it's but just a different method of stylization that's the thing yeah. so using the word stylized if, isn't always relevant to what no. you're looking at if everything looked the same people are going or oh, if it looks the same yeah they, you, they're damned in that they do, they're damned yeah. if they don't <laughs> with it's, a knotted um, hanky if it looks the same Mary Poppins <laughs> oh, you know, I don't mind moaning about you know ideas or once you've seen the film the story or but the nuances and the minutiae like this leave it alone and go and boil your head in shampoo <laughs> very specific instructions at the end and um, yeah. one thing have you noticed all those wires on the center console yeah this is this is hands very thing isn't it he sort of takes nice things and destroys them and craps them up I think that's the general impression I'm getting about the Falcon. You know, Rob, we spoke last week, didn't we, about the the look of the new Falcon in Han Solo, blue and white. 
Did we talk about that last week? I thought it came out afterwards. Have you talked about it with maybe with one of the on one of the Kessel runs? Oh, I might have done. Yeah, I don't recall. He's seeing another person behind your back. I know. I'm daily, seeing, it I'm seeing another podcast. Um, yeah, yeah. It's um, the Falcon in the Han Solo movie is going to belong to Lando, right? And it's going to be white with blue decals, and it's going to include the mechanism that goes between the front forks that helps load cargo. Right. Oh, so push cargo. It's going to be very much a functional sort of version of the ship. It's going to work and it's going to be pristine because obviously Lando's a man of, ex- of exquisite taste and style. Uh, and then Han will get it and sort of pull that thing apart. So it kind of, it will, it will uh, reframe Lando's, what have you done to my ship when it turns up in Bespin? Yeah, true. If, you know, it was this glossy hot rod when. Lando owned it, and now uh, Han has just like run it into the ground. I think that's pretty cool, especially the thing about the cargo, the pod that goes in between the two forks for loading cargo. If that's present when they're using it in this movie, and by the time we get to A New Hope, it's gone, mm. and we hear that Han dropped his cargo because of the Imperial, you know, it's it's kind of tying stuff together, even albeit very loosely, but it's still kind of cool. Hmm. So blue and white. There's a picture of it somewhere on the internet. It's the the design. I think that's very close to the design from Revenge of the Sith when the ship made a bit of a cameo. Drop it in the show notes, Marcus. Uh, I you cannot because I am hosting a podcast. Okay, we're going to move it's into busy. the uh, episode nine stuff now. At the episode nine of it, or oh, I'll send it to you afterwards. Uh, I've been hardly hmm, any definitely. of that in there. Uh, yeah. Uh, only only two little news items. Um, okay. Snippets. J.J. Hmm. Abrams is to return to Star Wars and replace Colin Trevorrow as the director of Star Wars Episode Nine. He'll also be co-writing with okay. Chris... Is it Terrio? Uh, I think so, yeah. Yeah, or Trey. Chris, Ter- Chris Terry. Is it Chris Terry? Have I got that right in the show notes? Because I thought that I'm not have... sure. <laughs> now, now you've made me doubt me myself. Hang on. Yeah, you're not doubting uh, yourself, old chap. You're doubting I'll me. Check. I'll, let me search Argo because yep. that'd be the quickest. Please result. do. I, th- I think it's Chris Terrio. Um, it is Chris Terrio. Yes, Chris Terrio. Okay, so yeah, co-writing with Chris Terrio, who got an Oscar for Argo, mm-hmm. um, but also did something to Batman versus Superman. Which, if you watch the Ultimate Edition, is pretty good. Yeah, it's okay. Don't be a hater. I'm not hating. No. And he's, he's writing Justice League and Justice League Part 2 as well, by the look. That's essentially you're like that a qualifiers hater. <laughs> Possibly. Um, yeah. I haven't got the energy to hate on it. I'm just, I'm just disinterested in that entire that uh, is DC totally franchise. Fair. That is totally fair. But I loved Argo. Argo, I thought, was absolutely stunning. So if he can bring that level of game to Star Wars, then bring it on. Gentlemen, what do we make of these two pieces of news? JJ directing and co-writing with Chris Terrio. Paul, can we go to you first? I'm dealing with this with extreme caution, Mm -hmm. I'm afraid. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, the, The Force Awakens didn't split public opinion down the middle because otherwise it wouldn't have made a billion dollars uh it split a lot of critique um i'm not gonna say down the middle but there was a, an extreme uh, love hate situation go and i i wasn't extreme hate but i was on the you know i was on the i wasn't impressed with that side of things if that makes sense so on that side of the fence i was the dark somewhere side. i was somewhere on the dark side and i i don't i'm not you know remotely um <clears throat> changing my mind on that i still find uh, tfa to be um, Derivative. very light, very light for the amount of time and scope and stuff that Star Wars requires and so on. And I did find it rather unimaginative at the time, but there you go. But in light of that, we've obviously had many, many, many arguments, not us, but I'm talking about online, mm. all the fanboys, all the fans and so on and so forth. And those were listened to. And uh, JJ Abrams even came back and said, you know, well, we actually found ourselves in a position where we want to do this, 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 but we wanted to keep faithful to this, 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 which is why we ended up still where we had. And he said, but at the same time, he was in agreement with a lot of the critique, you know, that came his way. So yeah. maybe lessons will be learned. We don't know. Mm-hmm. But right now, I'm a little, I'm a little shy of it. I don't, I don't regard Jar Jar in um, quite the same reverence. 
many, many, many others do as a storyteller, to be completely honest. I like his, his best thing is to, to, you know, in the conception process. A lot of the stuff you see where J.J. Abrams is involved, he's involved in the conception process and things are always handed over. Uh, to be honest, you generally find when things have been handed over, they do fall somewhat. So obviously he does have some rod in his back because he does provide us with Ooh, amazing no. storytelling and so on. So, you know, look at the early days of Fringe and Lost and stuff. Mm. Very, very clever, <clears throat> addictive, mysterious stuff. But one of his biggest problems is leaving us with that mystery element as well. Mm. It's almost like he goes into a lot of conceptual ideas, not knowing where they're going. And sometimes they just fizzle away without any explanation and so on as well. So I don't know. With, um, I don't know. One, you know, r- right now, the way I see, the way he directs, the way I say, the way he tells stories and so on and so forth, my excitement for the episode nine is. <sighs> It's been dented somewhat. Really? We'll see. We'll see. Yeah. From Chris Terrio's point of view, loved Argo. Uh, I know it's a million. As a, as a true story, it is actually a million miles away from what actually really happened if you investigate. But it's a story, and as a movie, it's fantastic. I love it. I think it was one of Ben Affleck's best bits of work, to be honest, as well. Okay. Um. So yeah, good, interesting cocktail. Not particularly keen on director. Very keen on the what the writer might produce, though. But if the director learns lessons from what he did with TFA, we could be in for a treat. I just don't know. I'm just a bit tepid on that. No, I'm extremely tepid on it at the moment. Maybe he feels like he has unfinished business there, Paul. Possibly, Maybe yeah. That's why he's having another swing at it. Um, all right, Rob, well said, Paul. Rob? Uh, I think given the options we have, that's probably the best option they could have chosen. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm kind of cautiously optimistic. I know that uh, fandom was pouring scorn upon anybody who said now we might get a retelling of Jedi but I mean he, I, I find it I can deal with people who don't let the similarities to New Hope bother them in Force Awakens but I can't deal with the fans who just flat out deny they're there because they strike me as a little bit um, Dis- disingenuous yeah it just, it's not intellectually honest mm-hmm. uh, to, to, to suggest that they're not in the least bit connected or the remotest bit similar it's just not true so you know, um, I can deal with, like I say, I can deal with giving it a chance. I will happily give him a chance. Like I say, I think of the choices that were available, I think he's the best, the best pick because he's already got pedigree with making a successful movie. Um, I saw something, I think it was Carlos in the VIP group speculated that uh, maybe JJ had seen a rough cut of The Last Jedi gone to Kathleen. Oh, I've, oh, you know what you could do with that? And then they took it to Colin Trevorrow and he wasn't willing to change what he'd done. I think that's, I think that just feeds kind of too much into the Trevor O hate, which is appeared before. You know, obviously after a uh, book of is it Book of Henry, the film that's that everybody's right. panning. That's right. Yeah. Uh, ever since then, there seems to have been an un- inordinate amount of hate for the man. Mm. Um, yeah, yeah. So I wonder if that's just a symptom of kind of convenience of like, oh well, he's probably just being a bit of a. I heard he's, you know. The, the rumour is he's been a bit of a diva, but at the same time, I think that is a bit of a reach. Yeah, a pinch of salt with all those stories. Absolutely, yeah. This yeah, is what the, I'm, the timing what I mean. of them yeah. is very interesting, isn't it? It's interesting what you said early on, Rob. You were talking about availability. Uh, you know, Mr. and Mrs. Smith don't know who is available for these films. We don't know about the schedules all these guys are doing globally with all their movies. So, um, you know, everyone's saying, oh, we want, um, it was I'm Patty, sorry, you know, who was Patty? What's her name? You know, the Wonder Woman. Patrick yeah, man, people's, people are saying what Matt Reeves. I said I wanted Matt Reeves, but we, uh, now I've discovered he's doing the Batman. So, you know, yeah. these people are inundated with all sorts of work. They are quite busy with other things. And Indeed. They get to so <laughs> it's not just a pick and choose. It. I mean, Mr. and Mrs. Smith think it's just, oh, get that person, do it. You know, but yeah. they're normally 12 movies deep already. Yeah. So mm-hmm. there is an availability option. Yeah, some, of the, some of the better directors usually have more than one project on the go. They might be like the Spielbergs of the world might be in post on one thing. Re- a principal on something else and pre on mm-hmm. the the next project. Ridley Scott's the same. He's always got multiple balls in the air. Patty, <laughs> Patty Jenkins, I think, has only just become unavailable, but that's in terms of when the news hits the trades. That's probably been in negotiations for some time, as is this thing with JJ. This didn't just happen this week. It was announced this week. I imagine the talks have been going on for some time. 
Um, so I they're think probably Colin not going to get rid of a director without having a director, but the announcements no. were very timed for media purposes and so yeah. on. So and to just JJ was probably pulled in a month ago. <laughs> they were very, they were very um, respectful with the way they managed Colin publicly, and um, and he's been very respectful. Mm -hmm. and there's been no um, blood spill yet, is there? So no. Well, we, we're doing the spilling as fandom that we're the ones sort of turning on Colin Trevorrow. Yeah, I, I find it a little bit, you know, I, I find it a little bit distasteful, to be honest, when we're sort of, when people are really pouring scorn upon him. Yeah. Because, because uh, I, because I guarantee you those same people, if let's say for argument's sake, they'd cast Patty Jenkins mm. and then she'd written a new, she'd released a new movie in the interim that was an absolute Dog. floater. <laughs> Nobody would be calling for her to be canned. It just seems like they're picking on Colin Trevorrow because... He's the rich white guy. Well, there is that. It's a know. safe target. Yeah, then, oh, totally. You yeah, know, there's, there, I think there's something to that. It's also, I think, there's a sport in Hollywood of if you get a whiff of the fact that someone might even dare to be arrogant slightly, then yeah. they're fair game and you load you load a larger bore and try and take them down. I think that's... Maybe, yeah. Yeah. Um, there's nothing easier than throwing weight at others, Mark. It's a it's habitual. Um, yeah, Mark. Anyway, yeah, Mark. anyway, I've heard my name said far too many times in the last couple of seconds. Um, <laughs> Stephen, I love the idea. Excellent. Moving on to the next piece of news. <laughs> <laughs> I look okay. It's easy for me to sit here and tell you how easy it is to direct. Steve, before you go on, I just want to paint everybody a mental image that happened to me there when he said right so here's it goes i pictured him sitting in a chair facing the wrong way as if to say like <laughs> let's wrap it <laughs> i'm sitting on a chair backwards <laughs> carry on steve um it'd be easy for anyone who isn't a director to flag off directors because it's probably bloody hard to make a good film and to pull all those pieces together the fact that you can do it at all and end up with a product that actually works and you can play on them in the movies and it makes sense and mm. is amazing. So, but we don't have all the nuances of directorship to go by. We just have the end result films. And the, the truth is I don't like JJ Abrams film. I didn't yeah. like super eight. I didn't like lost the TV series. I didn't, didn't like uh, Cloverfield. They didn't particularly like Souls as Star Trek. They were, they were pretty good, but they were very shallow. Okay. But they they kind of work. And I hated the Force Awakens. There's no because it was all those things. And the trouble, what worries me is obviously that we're going to have another re repeat of that. There's a slight chance that he might he might redeem himself, and that's why he wants to do it, and that would be fantastic. But overarching all of that, what worries more, more than anything else is that Colin Trevolo had a problem with Lucasfilm. And that yeah. was probably because he, he had some great ideas that he couldn't put to fruition because they was arguing with the studio all the time. And they like to play it safe. And J.J. Abrams is a yes man. And he'll do what they want him to do. Well, I think let's, let's walk that back a touch. <laughs> a, a, a touch on the, uh, on the condescending side. I would... D do you mean condescending? Yeah, um, <laughs> and, and not a little that, person. That's not, I'm not saying prison. that's the case. I'm saying that's what worries me. Yeah, but what I'm, I think what you mean, Steve, is that he's got proven track record of being able to work with Lucasfilm and do what they want him to do. Yeah, and and to kind of to to go with the Lucasfilm kind of formula, right? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Cool. Yeah. This is yeah. just play the safe just, route. Just to add to that, I think I, I mentioned this. I did a Kessel run, I don't know, yesterday or maybe it was today's, where I, I spoke about this exact thing that if you hire somebody to do a job for you and, they, and they've and they been set a brief, like so I, I, the, um, the analogy I ran was if you say to someone, I want you to come and take colour photographs and they turn up loaded for black and white film saying, no, I'm going to do it this way, they're not doing what you ask them to do. And yeah. what I'm hearing from a lot of outlets now is that both with Lord and Miller and with Colin Trevorrow, they were asked to do one thing. And mm -hmm. because they are slightly more powerful um, filmmakers, they decided, I'm going to do something else. Right. And they weren't collaborative enough to fit into 
the brief that they were sent by Lucasfilm. Okay. Now, a lot of these people, Rob, you you alluded to this thing that came out earlier in the show. Um, there's been a lot of people sniping now at Colin Trevorrow. Yeah, I think it's distasteful. It's distasteful, and they're saying that he's arrogant, and they're mm-hmm. saying that Kathy simply won't sit still for this sort of stuff. They made reference to his behaviour on Jurassic World and how <laughs> he's very... Based on- He's over, yeah. over he's, he, what did they say? They was really, really, really confident. And, and you know, this, what they're getting it's at is that he's almost like he made a really popular movie that managed to recapture nostalgia of, of a franchise that's been 20 plus years past. Yeah. I wonder what he'd be suited for. Yeah. You know, <laughs> yeah. It's honestly, um, you know, the, the, the thing is, there's probably, there's probably a, f- some elements of truth in there. Now I heard somebody say, I think it was oh, on the sure. Slash Film Daily the other day where they said, or it might have been the main Slash Film, you can't be a filmmaker without having a degree of arrogance, but not that doesn't necessarily have to be a derogatory word. They have to be extremely confident and sure of themselves when they're running what essentially is a small business for a couple of years. Not even a small business, a significant business when they're making a movie and they set up a company around it. They're responsible for hundreds of millions of dollars, hundreds, thousands of people's livelihoods, and they've got to answer to certain masters. They're Mm. not, it's not like George, he only worked for himself. Please do. I was going to say, you just, you actually just entered, you just said it then. We are celebrating one of the greatest movies of all time because it was written by a guy that didn't toe the party line. Hmm. Yeah, he didn't have to. This is, the, you know, this is the bitter irony of, of mm, Star Wars. Time. <laughs> that it grew out of a desire. It grew out of an Zoe, independent Zoe trope, um, decentralizing the filmmaking process, moving north to, to San Francisco, Francis Ford Coppola, George Lucas, Walter Murch, all of them. When they all set off, they decided, we're just going to do this independent. Mm. We're going to break the chains and Lucasfilm now is on the other side of that paradigm. It absolutely mm. is. It belongs to one of the planet's biggest corporations. A little it, Disney thing, yeah. It makes an incredible yeah. amount of money. And for Indeed. the first time in history, Lucasfilm answers to a company and its shareholders. And that's the, I know, Steve, sometimes, you know, you talk about the fact that they want to make money, and it sounds flippant, but you're absolutely right. They have to have one eye on that ball now because... That's- well, that's just reality, isn't it? The, they the, to they can't masters. survive. Yeah, they don't survive without making money. Exactly. And the way they make money is to do things that make the company money. And the way it's historically made money is how it's most likely to work. And now, you know, Lucasfilm has been functioning like this for a while after the prequels when it's produced movies like Red Tails and, and any other uh, IP it's been involved with. It's been doing this stuff, but it hasn't had all the world's attention. Now it's mm. got the entire planet's attention because yeah. making Star Wars is a newsworthy thing. So, um, unfortunately, someone like Colin Trevorrow comes in and because of the relative ease, and I'm putting that in air quotes, that he's made it from safely not guaranteed to Jurassic World, like mm. with the support of Steven Spielberg and now he's on Star Wars. A lot of people think you, you haven't earned that. How, yeah, but- how have you earned that? Yeah, but who are they? You exactly. Know, I mean, that exactly. Sounds really, you know. No, you just. It sounds a bit like. But they're not, you know. They they're haven't. Just detractors. They're just faceless detractors. But that is yeah. a lot of the noise on the internet, isn't it? At the end. Oh, of for the sure. Day. Yeah. So people criticise him for being, you know, that he's been given an easy ride of it because of his connections to Steven Spielberg. But the fact is, he still delivered on. Sure. Um, on the Jurassic World movie. Yeah, and he failed to deliver on the book of Henry, but the fact is that was a much smaller movie, and he was free to make all the mistakes he wants on that film. It's yeah. unfair, I think, to beat him around the head with this entire episode. Do you remember a, f- a few months ago when I said I think it's probably a good idea if he walks away from Star Wars because yeah. of this exact thing? Mm-hmm. The book of Henry was gonna meant that everyone was gonna watch his time on Episode Nine. And wait for him to trip up. Wait for it to fail. This I made these comments when Lord and Miller went. Yeah, that I thought I didn't. I wasn't sure that Colin Trevorrow's career could survive 
a storm like this. You know, look at right. where's Josh Trank after that thing that happened with Fantastic Four and he left Star Wars. What mm. has he done? He's still in director jail. So mm. with, and I need to point out legally, that's not an actual jail. Um, yeah. But with Colin Trevorrow, he's had a perceived failure in the book of Henry. I didn't, I wasn't sure his career would hold up all that well to the critical lambasting he was going to get through yeah. his connection to Star Wars. And it's happening now, even when he's still he's leaving it. the project, it's yeah. happening. So it might be in his best interest to get as far away from this thing as possible now. Yeah, maybe. It's a shame, though. It's a because shame. If, it's it, unfair. It's also, the problem is, where does it end? Like I say, if it's just a question of every time somebody involved in the project gets uh, has a misstep on the way, even if it's completely irrelevant, which Book of Henry is, are we just are these like detractors just going to crap on everything? Yes, but this is the problem. Like you know, where does it end? Like I say, would they have done it with Patty Jenkins? I mean, possibly not, because I think the same type of people who are detracting are probably not the kind of people who are going to take bet, that risk. You can bet your bottom bottom dollar. Uh, excuse me. You can bet your bottom dollar if Wonder Woman had fouled, it's people would be say. saying, yeah, or not, as the case maybe. People <laughs> would be saying that Patty Jenkins single handedly. Um, retarded the, and, and 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 a woman's ability to step up to these mega blockbusters, you know, fine. Wonder Woman was successful, so Patty yeah. Jenkins is being celebrated, rightly so, for being a wonderful sure. director, rightly Absolutely. so. Absolutely, yeah, she did a great job. But if she had fouled, she'd have been burnt mm. at the stake for pushing back the progress that female directors have made up to this point, you know. Yeah, and I still maintain... It's a very fickle thing. Yeah, and I still maintain as well that she would have struggled up until the movie... Like I say, if she'd been announced for episode nine, they would have been given... You know, certain people would have given her the same scrutiny that that Colin Trevor got. Like I say, some people have blinkered to it and they wouldn't touch it with a 10-foot pole because they're afraid of, you know, the the repercussions of what people could infer from it. But, um, you know, there would be a group of people who'd be watching her like a hawk and they would trace her away too. I mean, it's you only have to look at um, what happened to Claudia Gray on Twitter this week uh, to see that some of these fans are a little bit... What know, happened? She, basically, she went on a panel with, I think it was like Tim Zahn and a few other authors, and she made a comment that sounded like she was saying that she had an insight into what was coming post-episode 9. It was, right. just a, it was a, just a gap. It was just a you know one of those things where she worded something a little bit, you know, left it a little bit open and, and people took in I'm not even going to say it was clumsy wording because like I said, I think some of these people are just desperate to hear what they want to hear. Um, the storm that followed led her to stop using her Twitter account because oh, really? people were just like, what do you know? Tell us, what do you know? Oh God. Like, yeah. And she's like, she's not allowed to be a fan anymore. You know, she doesn't have this magical insight into Lucasfilm. Not for nothing. I'm not convinced Lucasfilm know what's coming up post episode nine. No. I mean, maybe a Kenobi movie, but, you know, we don't know, and mm. sh- and she's not likely to know either. No, I think you're right. I don't. I don't think. I mean, that's unfortunate. That she's gone through that, but I don't think anyone really she, knows. She may come back. I don't know, but like but, for now, at least her account's been active. I think it was active today. It's still active, but I don't know if she's actually using it herself. I think she said oh, she was right. going to give it to an assistant or something. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. Well, the thing about um, you know, where the Lucasfilm go now? Is this going to be? Will the, Will there be a recurrence of this thing? I don't yeah. think so. I think we've reached um, a critical mass for this sort of cock up from Lucasfilm now. I think Uma. that um, my my speculation has been that they had to get the bases loaded for these films coming out of the acquisition, so that the shareholders felt comfortable that there mm-hmm. was for there were going to be motion. a return on investment. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Um, and now we've come to this. Now we've gotten to this point where they've got two successful films. They've got three in different stages of production, and we're ready to take the next next step forward. And Lucasfilm, particularly Kathy, I think now has realised that if if you're going to be successful and you want your filmmakers to have freedom to create, then you're going to have to bring in collaborative filmmakers that understand what it is you're asking them to make for you. Yeah, they're not saying. Is a truck full of cash. Go and do what you want. You're saying, yeah. please make me this thing. And so yeah. you you make that thing that you're being paid to make within the confines of the brief. Mm-hmm. You're free to write the script for Star Wars and you're free yeah. to film it however you see fit. 
but you have to to, hit certain beats or it isn't a Star Wars film. Yeah, and also, not for nothing, but if, you know, if if your boss, which is who Kathy Kennedy would be at that point, turns around to you and says, I'm not sure I'm on board for where this is going, you can't turn around and say, no, I know better. Yeah. It just doesn't work. Like, name, you know, if you can name me a business where that works, then I'll be in your, you know, in your kind of stead, but I don't, it's not possible because there no. isn't one. No success, well, no successful business anyway. Um, it just doesn't happen. You know, you, you, like you said, you get given a brief and you make it to the best of your abilities within that brief. Mm. But like I say, if a, if a uh, film, you know, if the sort of stakeholder, which is who Kathy Kennedy would at the very least be considered, comes to you and says you need to sort of rethink this particular aspect of it, you can't just turn around and go, what do you know? It yeah. turns out quite a lot. Yeah, look at a filmography. Well, quite. It just, it, it's, um, this whole affair is unfortunate, you know, that they, they called it too late. They, they realized that Lord and Miller weren't producing what they'd expected mm-hmm. when they were well in production, at least with the episode nine, they've gotten there ahead of time so they could yeah. catch Colin before it got before cameras, you know, before it was in front of cameras, they mm-hmm. at least got to catch it at the scripting stage. Now, yeah. so what you like about JJ, he obviously was an easy experience for Kathy to work yep. with or he wouldn't be invited back. And yep. I think he's learned how to do this thing for Lucasfilm. And also, you now I think the requirements he had on TFA have gone. It's not. It's no longer the soft reboot for Star Wars. It's no longer the nostalgia trip. It's, uh, it's not reminding people what Star Wars is and having them fall in love with it all over again. Mm-hmm. He's free pretty much to do what he wants. Yeah. Prefer- Again, he'll be given he'll be given a brief. Yeah. Yeah. He'll be given maybe a sort of uh an outline of the kind of tone they want. And it's gonna be on him, he's gonna be free to achieve that in whatever way he sees fit. Yeah. That's just, you know, again, I think that's something and also, you know, not for nothing, but within Star Wars universe he's earned it. He's the only. He's the first person besides Lucas to come back for a second one. Yeah, and look at that. Look at the box office. Well, exactly. You know, look he's proved. He's proven at the very least he can make a, ret- a significant return on investment, which is what they're in- they're, mo- they're significantly interested in. Now, I wonder. I mean, this is a, a little bit off topic, but I wonder how people are gonna um, feel when this film does less box office, and how how JJ will be perceived when this inevitably does less box office than Hmm. The Force Awakens. Well, I mean, there's going to be people who are going to read into that what they want to read, because I mean, even people I follow on Twitter who I'd normally not necessarily disagree with were, some people were saying that Rogue One was a flop because it didn't make as much as TFA, even though I don't imagine that anybody at Lucasfilm thought that was remotely possible. possible. No. So, you know, I think either way you're going to get people who are going to go down that route, but... Yeah, because the trick is just uh, ignore them as best you can. I guess the data is there to be repurposed as a as the user sees fit, isn't it? All right, yeah, let's um, let's get to this last piece piece of news so we can wrap things up because we are running particularly long this week. So, um, Star it's Wars cool. Episode Nine moves back to December. So, hot off the news that JJ was returning to direct, this film gets pushed back from May to December. I'm sure he was a large part to do with that. Yep, because he wants time to. Um, Right from scratch, this yeah. movie. So, gentlemen, Steve, you, I, I don't feel you had a fair and a big enough run at that last question. Should we start with you? December for episode nine. What's your take? Um, well, it, it says a lot about Colin's work, doesn't it? I guess they weren't happy with any of it. They're rewriting the whole thing. Well, they've gone. Um, they've gone back to to scratch after losing Carrie, hadn't they? So they did have stuff down. Yeah. And then, yeah. then they lost Carrie, so it kind of forced upon them in April, it kind of forced upon them the need to to start over. Well, the, the, sta- that- the statement was made in April, I should clarify. Yeah, but I, I'm assuming Colin had quite a lot down, even at that point. Yeah, um, yeah, most likely. But it's a bit weird that they are going, so they were, this is obviously a running thing where they weren't happy with most, if not all of it. Yeah, because they'd, so- they'd brought in Jack Thorne, not so long ago, I think um, maybe July, they'd okay. they'd brought Jack Thorne in to take another pass at Colin and Derek Connolly, the co-writer on episode nine, to take another pass at their script. 
So they're okay. already bringing in another uh, creative. Well, I think it's good that they're writing it from scratch again. Yeah. I think that's a good idea. Because I think that's then you can, perfectly they can reasonable. They can revisit Carrie again, really nail yep. that down. Yeah, I totally agree. And get that right. Yep. So in that sense, I think JJ Abrams is doing the right thing. Mm-hmm. Yes. So there you go. That's a positive spin on it. Yeah. All right, quick question before we get the other two guys' input on this date move. Do you think now JJ's on board and we've moved the date and we've got right. another writer? Yeah. Basically, we're back to square one. The, all okay. the whiteboards are clean. Yep. Has JJ got, is JJ in a position where he can say to Kathy, I really want to consider finding a way to bring Carrie back to this project? Ooh, that's an interesting. Used no. footage from TFA, no. CGI. Because it'll go, it'll go back on what Kathleen Kennedy gave us some months ago. Yeah, but everything's changed since then, Paul. Doesn't matter. Those, those kind of statements don't get reversed often. Be a uh, nice shot, though, for people. Uh, you, well, but we don't know what's been agreed with Carrie Fisher's estate. True. We know. We know a part. We know. They would be, I mean, yeah, no, you're right. Let me just qualify what I'm about to say by saying you're absolutely right. We don't know because Todd Fisher came out and said, Star Wars, what is Star Wars without Carrie? She's she's as big a part of it as anything. Yes, she can be in it. But then he might have held his hands out and said, five billion, please. So then, yeah, that might have been the, you know, so the family got on board and said, absolutely fine. The terms of that agreement may not have been to Lucasfilm's liking. That's a cynical Mm -hmm. way of looking at it. They might have just said, no, we're not doing it because the money's not right. Right. I don't expect that was the case. I think Kathy and all at Lucasfilm were coming from a position similar to the one Christopher Nolan took on the Joker. Mm -hmm. No, the actor that brought that character to life isn't there anymore. So the character won't be used. And Kathy did say, you know, I think Todd was a little bit premature with his comments. Um, I just wonder now whether we've got a director with enough weight to sort of sit Kathy down and say, rethink this. There's a way we can do it and it will, the fans will love it. It's exactly what the story needs. It It's respectful to both Carrie and, and to the character of Leia. It will be unexpected because we've all been primed not to, you know, to forget it. It's not going to happen. But mm. Kathy could say, you know, I didn't think it was possible. Then JJ brought me this idea and then I realised it was right. So there is a way to walk back her position. I don't. Mm. I just wonder whether or not JJ is the guy that could do that, facilitate uh-huh. that. Not. I don't think, though. I don't think yeah, they will. I think there's far. It's far more likely they'll just, you know, do what they kind of what they did with uh, Paul Bettany, and maybe give her story responsibilities, depending on what they are. Obviously, yeah. Uh, if there's story responsibilities that can be transferred over, they will. That's yeah, I my mean, feeling on it. They could do if it's a familial story responsibility it could pass to Luke. If it's mm-hmm. a political story responsibility it could pass to Laura Dern's character or Poe Dameron. Yes, yeah. you know, there's there are there's rooms to manoeuvre. There's room to manoeuvre. So, Rob, what do you think about the date move? Uh, I think it makes perfect sense. To be honest, um, I think it possibly it would be not for nothing as well. But I can imagine if I was if I was JJ Abrams, and you know, we can only hope that I'm never in that position. <laughs> oh my! Uh, but I would probably be more comfortable directing something I'd written. No, in yeah, that situation. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I mean, it's you know, we might never, might turn out that uh, what's it called? Um, it might turn out that you know we will obviously never know what Colin Trevorrow was was going with. We might hear about it one, might hear about some vague ideas one day, and there might be nothing, absolutely nothing wrong with it in terms of what's you know the ideas that were discussed. They they might be okay. Mm-hmm. It might just be that, like you know, like say the tone was different, or maybe he was not as collaborative as they might have hoped. That sort of thing. Mm. Um, so I, I think it's fine. I think it, like I say, it makes perfect sense to me. I think he's, it's very sensible, especially while he has the time. If he's been able to get the time, which he's obviously negotiated, then I think you should take that opportunity to to, to redo it. Yeah. 
Um, not so sure it's going to affect the start of principal photography because that's scheduled for January as far as I understand, but I think mm -hmm. they're going to buy the time they need for post. Yeah. Paul, Paul your take on the move, the date move? I, I thought we were always expecting these films to come out December's anyway. <laughs> well, so. we, we were, but Han and um, I don't know if they ever made a firm statement about nine, but Han was always December, and then it just moved to 2018, and mm. and then it was May. Uh, I was always expecting a December movie, so right. <laughs> Seriously, the matter of the loop. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I, I much prefer the December date. I like Star Wars at Christmas. Yeah, it's it is a Christmas type of situation as well. I know it's not, you know, as much as Die Hard's a Christmas film, so is Star Wars. Um, so, <laughs> it, but it is now it's I something, have a lightsaber. It's, ho, ho. it's something I expect <laughs> near Christmas time. Yippee yeah. Kaye, yeah, first yeah, order. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, that's good actually. Yippee Kaye, Yippee Kaye, yeah, Mon uh, Mothma. <laughs> that should that should be the episode title, shouldn't it? Hello, Mr. Jedi. <laughs> it's um, yeah, it has definitely become a part of that end of the year for me. I love it. I'm I'm hoping that they'll push Han Solo back as well. I think Ron Howard could do wonders with that extra sort of six months in post production. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly, if they could free up the change to sort of go back and do some more shooting. Um, but. Pew. Pew, pew, but it's um I don't know how likely that is in the moment. I secretly think it will happen, but I'm not seeing much evidence to support Can't that. Say right secretly now. out loud. Okay, well, <laughs> all right. Secretly. Believe it will no, happen. Yeah, yeah, no, but still still, am I still negating the, the concept? Mm -hmm. It's like telling everyone you feel breezy. Yeah. <laughs> I'm breezy. Excellent. That's a second second friends reference. All right. I think um I think we probably talk this all to death, haven't we? Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make a unilateral decision to say that we all support the JJ Abrams hiring, and I'm also gonna make a unilateral decision to say <laughs> maybe don't. <laughs> Democracy. Um, I want to be proved wrong. That's all I can say. Yeah, no, that's what I said. I yeah. said that. I hope I'm wrong. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I think that's perfectly fair. I mean, the way I always explain it is, if something like that. And I'm scared. Something like that happens. I'm skeptical. Nobody's going to be happier than me if I'm wrong. No, yes. big time. I'll yeah. loop it up. If it's, you know, I'll be yeah. honest. If they, if it blows my mind, I'll be really pleased to say so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if, well it just, if it just blows, we'll all be really disappointed. <laughs> oh my. Yeah, I don't. I don't think it will. I I would much rather have seen Ryan involved be, purely because he's just set those characters down and he makes the most sense to me to pick but them up. We don't up know whether eight's going to be crap yet, Mark. That's not the point I'm making. This is the thing. This is why I keep coming back to this, um, to my position on this, because that's I get challenged online about that continually, that, we, yes, we haven't seen Ryan Johnson's movie. It could just be a bunch of paper cutouts on sticks with him mm -hmm. going, pew, pew, pew. But continuity is nice. I think that's the unlikely, but, the, yeah, I'll take your point. It... it I haven't done the math on it. There is a percentage, but it's very, very small. Um, I, but you know, the, what makes sense to me is he's written the characters up to the end of that film. He's in the best position to pick them up and tell their story going forward. It's not just like it should never be the case. Like JJ at the end of Force Awakens, he just put them down and said someone else's problem walked away. That's a negative frame, but you know that's kind of the idea. He was done with it. He didn't have to think about where they went beyond that film. He was only on that film. Mm. Um, and with Ryan coming out of episode eight, I would have loved to have seen him say, I know where to take these guys now. I know what happens next because I had mm. to think when I was, when I was writing the whole thing, I had to think about where they would be after this. Yeah. Um, and that would put him in the, in a uniquely, um, suited position to sort of move forward and tell that story. I just hope that JJ is able to, I mean, clearly he's seen a cut of Last Jedi at this point, and he would have read the script. He knows everything. Yeah. Um, to to start shaping, I just it hope is going to be interesting because the, fully. the the main stars have openly said on you know the one of the trailer reels we had that kind of that oh, the, behind the scenes, the scenes reel. They all said that um, you know he's made a story that is definitely Star Wars, but he's also made something that's very standalone. So I wonder yes, if JJ is like, blimey, man, what have you left? From me? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Everybody's dead. This? 
As it, whatever planet they're on just yeah. explodes. At the I've end. only got three porgs. <laughs> <laughs> three porgs and a little rel- and yeah. a little galaxy. Yeah. yeah. We'll see. Okay. Mm. All right, let's wrap this one up then for the week, shall we? Right then. Um, thank you for listening to Talk Star Wars again this week. Don't forget to head over to iTunes and leave us that five-star review we spoke about earlier. You will benefit from the Ron Burgundy guarantee if you do. So if you write in that five-star review, we will read as long as it's clean. So if you want to promote something like your own blog or your podcast, that's the place to do it. Uh, you can email us your questions and comments to talkstarwarsinfo at gmail.com. Or you can reach out to us on one of our many social channels like Twitter, Facebook, YouTube. That's a good place at the moment, for vibrant mm-hmm. conversation. Instagram, yeah. Tumblr, and everywhere else. Uh, with that said, gentlemen, as long as all three of you are still awake, <laughs> where can people find you between shows? You can find me on yeah. Wild About Nature on YouTube and Stephen underscore where on Twitter. You'll find me at movieschoolnews.com on the interweb. You'll find me on Facebook and Twitter as Movie School News. Uh, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Rob Wade Vision, and you can find everything non-talk Star Wars related that I do over at emotionally14.com. Splendid. You can find everything I do at talkstarwars.co.uk, and I'm also on Twitter as at Talk Star Wars. Check out the Star Wars Commonwealth podcast network at starwarscommonwealth.com. Our partner shows are over there, and they're all churning out extraordinary work in large large volumes and they're all worth your time largeness Um, largeness all over the place right we will be back next week have a good one everybody bye bye guys bye turtles talk star wars is a proud member of the star wars commonwealth podcast network find us at starwarscommonwealth.com alongside the tumbling saber podcast the Generation X-Wing Podcast. The TSW Roundtable. The Skyhoppers Podcast. And the Nerd Room Podcast. Head to StarWarsCommonwealth.com. Take your first steps to a larger world. It's a wrap. It's a wrap. <laughs>